Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever the case may be for all of you listening out there across the crazy planet Earth. Welcome to Vestiges After Dark. And I am your host, Bishop Brian Willett, coming to you live from the deep woods of Western Georgia on this April 2nd, 2024. Tonight, I'm your guest and your host, and uh, we're going to be covering the Epicurean paradox, the nature of evil, and what place does it have in God's creation? Why is it here? If God's so great, if he's so wonderful, then why do we deal with evil? We're going to crush the Epicurean paradox tonight, and um, I don't even need Christianity to do it. You don't want to miss it. Don't go away. Everybody, once again, I am your host, Bishop Brian Willett, and tonight we have a fantastic evening planned, assuming the weather cooperates, of course. Um, There is a massive tornado threat throughout the entire southeast of the United States, and um, I think if I'm looking at, if I'm reading the projections for tonight um, correctly, looks like the first two segments should be safe. It's the third segment that might be in danger of getting cut off. So we're going to go as far as we can go with this tonight. And um, hopefully we'll be able to have our third uh, hour of discussion because, um, well, it's going to be a fascinating one. I can tell you that right now. And it's going to be a little bit of a different format as well. Not only am I um, hosting the show alone tonight, although Jamie is with us. We'll bring her on here uh, remotely in just a moment. Um, We're going to deal with the questions from the ether in the normal way. Um, and then when we get to the second segment, I'm going to give, um, a breakdown. Um, that was one of those shows where we're going to make it very educational, uh, tonight. So I'll, it won't be really a lecture though. It might be a little bit like that. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I never know how it's going to play out, but I'm going to teach you about the Epicurean paradox and I'm going to show you how we can dismantle it. Um, and then whenever I'm done, which I don't expect to need the full hour to do that, we're going to take our, uh, last break at the end of that point. And then I'll come back and then we'll finish the show. Um, and the third segment will be longer than usual if, if I finish on time. Uh, and then we can discuss it with our panel because I'm sure each and every one of them will have uh, their own perspectives on it and everything that we're going to talk about tonight. So it's going to be interesting. Um, I really am looking forward to this one. It's, it's, it's something that was asked of me a little while ago, and it's one that we've dealt with on this show in a briefer sense before. Um, but tonight we're going to actually break it down because the Epicurean paradox is something that atheists love to use as an argument against um, Christianity. The funny thing is, is um, Epicurus was not <laughs> was not <laughs> was a was a pagan, and he wasn't trying to argue uh, the that that God didn't exist. In fact, he believed that the gods, as a pagan, did exist. He just didn't think they cared about anything. So, I mean, that's that's really the whole point of it. But we'll get into that on the second segment here. Uh, I want to give a shout out to our fantastic and wonderful moderators and volunteers. Uh, we have tonight uh, Mystic 
who is Danielle Moosh, who is Val Tracy, who is Tracy. <laughs> and um, we've got, of course, um, Jamie and Paula. I think Paula's out there too, right? I'm looking at the names. I can only go by what I see on my screen. Um, and then, you know, our normal panel tonight. So it should be really, really Great show, as usual. I also want to remind everybody that the show is church-sponsored, even though we don't always talk about theology or church topics. Um, we sponsor it as an educational program that is also entertaining to talk about things like the paranormal, the esoteric, the mystical, all right, uh, the supernatural, the occult, um, every facet of it uh, we cover on this show. And uh, the church sponsors it all. So uh, we can only do it by you sponsoring the church. And if you feel so inclined because you get something out of this broadcast, please feel free to go to our website and uh, provide a um, donation, uh, preferably a monthly pledge, because that's really what helps us um, to keep the show on the air and everything. You know, if you find value in it, then support it, please, because nobody else does. It's the church that does it. And uh, my, our audience should also support it, I think. Even if you don't believe in the church or like the church, I don't really care. But if you like this show, support the show, okay? Because nobody else is. I don't do advertisements except on the audio-only version for the podcast, and that's just to help pay for some of the, um, well, uh, some of the archive storage for past shows. All right. Well, we have tonight, uh, Jamie is coming to us from uh, two hours away in Georgia. How are you doing tonight, Jamie? <laughs> Good evening, all. Yeah, I decided to uh, not risk driving home and that stuff. And, you know, I've got basically a zoo here, so I didn't want to <laughs> didn't leave my animals alone. So I'm hunkered down here in the cabin with all the critters. And um, we just got issued a tornado watch, Bishop. Yeah. For all of Western oh, Georgia. Well, Western so. Georgia. Yeah. So there's, there's yeah. tornadoes out there and it's looking a little green. I have to say it is looking a little green. Um, so yeah, there's, um, there's a good chance we could get knocked off tonight. Hopefully we won't fly away, but the internet could fly away and then the show's over. But, uh, welcome to the Southeast part of the United States. You know, I personally, I'd rather have the hurricanes. Uh, that's just me. Um, <laughs> hurricanes were much easier to deal with when I lived in Florida, you know, no big deal. You know, you just stayed in for a few hours. It was over. But, uh, I mean, of course, you always had the Category 5s that would be devastating to certain certain places. But uh, overall, it wasn't so random. You know, you knew it was coming a long way out. <laughs> you had a lot of time to prepare. Um, these tornadoes, they just come out of nowhere, and they can, you know, just draw a line of devastation where, you know, your house could be completely leveled and both of your neighbors are just fine. It's just weird like that. Um, but we, uh, we have that on a regular basis this time of year. So it's not exactly unusual. I remember one, one time eating at the cheesecake factory over in Smyrna, um, after a church event, uh, it's actually, I think it was an order, one of the ordinations, honestly, back in the early days of the church. And, um, it, it, this guy got, kind of like it is right now. And, um, and all of a sudden people started screaming, you know, this cheesecake factory has very large windows that overlook the, uh, parking area. And, uh, everyone started screaming and we, and turned around and sure enough, there was a funnel cloud going right through the, uh, the, the parking lot. <laughs> it was only probably category one, but I guess nothing actually took flight. But everyone started screaming and crying and um, they were, you know, ducking under tables. And then I, I went into the into the restroom because I had to go to the bathroom. It's like, you know, I'm not, not going to wait for this. Um, and there was this guy cowering in the corner with his head between his knees, it, it, like bawling like a baby. It was a really um, kind of a sorry sight there. But um, yeah, he was yeah. scared. A lot of it, it evokes a lot of fear in some people. Personally, I'm just like, you know, when it's my time to die, it's my time to die. I don't really think about things like that and it's like i know i'm going to die in anyway so if it's a tornado well then so be it i'm not going to worry about it <laughs> you know i mean we don't make it out of this alive you know we don't make it out of this life has a 100 percent fatality rate so um it's not really worth your time actually that's very epicurean of me to say because that's actually the focus of Epicurus philosophy. Um, he, he really basically believed that um, death was not something to worry about or even concern oneself about. He says he, he used to feel that it, it, it just led to undue anxiety. Um, you can't do anything about it anyway. And um, Epicurus was kind of a, um, 
he was a true annihilationist in the sense that he just felt that the gods didn't care and um you know you're, everybody dies and everyone's just going to basically fade into nothing so you don't need to be afraid of nothing because you're not going to know what's happening when it happens so that was his 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 whole his whole thing um but uh, we're going to talk about how it uh, sort of evolved and it's going to be a good one tonight also coming to us from uh down under on the other side of the world in the future uh in the southern hemisphere we've got <laughs> we've got father chris yates uh in australia how you doing tonight I'm doing pretty well. I thought I'd mix it up today. I've, I've made myself an iced coffee. Oh, okay. So, um, I thought, I almost thought, I, thought, I almost I thought, thought it was an Irish cream or something, but I, you know, or a white Russian. I don't know, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not averse to drinking early, but I've probably got to get some work done this afternoon. So it's probably not a good idea. I understand but, no, that. I'm pretty well, our weather, our weather is, um, is pretty good at the moment. And we do get tropical storms, of course, here. We have had hurricanes. Um but uh, this time of year, it's just going into autumn. So, uh, sorry, fall. Uh, and so um, it's actually quite a nice time of year to be here. It tends to dry out a bit. Mm -hmm. You know, the humidity goes, but it's still warm. Um, so we've had, we've had some nice days. That's yeah. the way it is over here, too, when it, uh, when it um, goes to fall or st when, you know, when we start entering the, uh, the autumnal seasons, um it then it does it dries out cools off um and it's usually very mild weather for us during that time of year as well um so also coming to us from tennessee we have uh brandon also in the line of storms how you doing tonight brandon yeah i'm doing pretty good i've been trying to wait for the storms that pass but they just don't end yeah i mean it's it, this is the way it is you know i do i'll be honest with you i do miss being in the north uh, uh during during this time of year because um when we were up in the in the in the foothills the mountains protected us a lot so what you'd see is you'd see these hurricanes come in and then they'd hit the slopes of the mountain they go right back up again so when, when our house was in the mountains we never had to worry about really um, the tornadoes. They always just went around us. A um, lot of devastation on the lower elevations, but right where we were, you know, we could just, it, you, it would just go right over us every single time. Uh, we don't have that protection anymore. So uh, we just have to, you know, leave it to the grace of God. <laughs> um, I'm more concerned about the feed tonight, honestly, but we'll, we'll see how it goes because the rain will be enough to do it. <laughs> We don't right. even need wind and, and tornadoes to knock us off. All it takes is just like one lightning bolt and it's, it's, it's fried. You know, that's how it was uh, that one time we had JJ on. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get started with uh, questions from the ether. Brandon, we have a special one from email tonight. Did you want me to do that one first or do you want to do yours first? Yes, I'm pretty sure the two I have, you can get through them rather quickly so you can leave like the rest of the time because i'm pretty sure that the question you got is probably more involved it actually it actually isn't it's actually not a very long question uh, to answer to be honest uh, but it's up to you yeah i'll, I'll okay. yield to what you want uh we can answer that one first then okay. it's not too involved it's not it really isn't um it came in uh through email uh from gene and she said she was shocked to read this, yet had some serious doubts about its legitimacy, your opinion or comments. And she led, uh, she, she posted a link to an article entitled Greek Journalists Acquitted After Challenging Jerusalem Holy Fire Miracle. Okay. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about the uh, holy fire. Okay. Because if you're not Orthodox, you probably don't know anything about this, or you might've just got a passing understanding of it. Um, but what happens is that every, what's believed to happen, I should say, or what's said to happen over the last, uh, well, about since about, oh, it's actually going back way back. Like for example, there were reports of holy fire emanating out from the tomb of Christ, which is currently where the Church of the Holy Sepulcher is, um, back even to the uh, the fourth century. So it's old. It used to be believed to be these these lights that would um, ignite candles and things like that. By the ninth century, it became a um, these candles would light on Holy Saturday, 
on the evening of the Easter Vigil, the Orthodox Easter, of course, uh, in this particular context, uh, which makes it also kind of interesting. Um, but the real uh, issue is that this, they have said that this continues and has continued on all these hundreds of years, um, even to this day. And so people will completely crowd the Church of the Holy Sepulcher um, to experience this and they the the bishop when the bishops or priest comes out with the candles lit he goes into the tomb and they come out lit and so it's it's said to be a miraculous spontaneous um ignition of these candles through this holy fire this holy light that emanates out from the tomb of christ and like i said there are have been reports of this going way back to even the uh, fourth century i think was the first record of it um, but the incarnation of this miracle as it is said to happen now is more of a ninth century thing that has continued on so here's the thing there was a greek journalist his name is demetrius um, alikakos i believe i'm saying that name right we got some interesting names difficult names to say tonight so if i if I butcher your, one of these names, please forgive me. Um, but Demetrius, who has been in a five-year legal battle with the Orthodox Patriarchate of Jerusalem for, quote-unquote, fabricating evidence to prove the holy fire and Jesus' tomb does not ignite miraculously, but through the use of matches, he's actually been acquitted of this. Um, and so Jean is asking because she's always had some doubts about the miracle. However, she was shocked to see that there was actually, you know, a longstanding doubt here that has even led to a legal battle. Well, the doubt goes way back, folks. It goes way back. And it's actually an interesting story. Um, it goes all the way back to 1009, all right? Right around the time of the Great Schism. I mean, right before the Great Schism, right? Just before, like a few decades before the Great Schism. Of course, Jerusalem in 1009 uh, was, uh, was under the control of uh, Islam. Um, and one of the leaders, Al-Hakim B. Arm Allah, I believe is how you say his name, ordered the destruction of the Holy Sepulchre and its associated buildings um, because he was so outraged at what he regarded as the fraud that was being practiced by the monks there um, with their claim of there being a, a holy fire, a miraculous holy fire that would ignite the candles. Um, and so it started there. They, he destroyed the church, the original church of the Holy Sepulchre, because he was so enraged at this, at this fraud, this scheme, which did not, of course, help Christian-Muslim relations, I can tell you that. Then in 1238, Pope Gregory IX denounced the Holy Fire as a fraud. And he also um, uh, forbade Christians and Catholics from participating in the ceremony. It was believed to be um, a uh, white phosphorus that was being used. The candles would be dipped in white phosphorus, and white phosphorus can ignite in oxygen. So it right. can it can self ignite that way. It looks miraculous, and of course, you know that kind of science would have been kind of magical to people from in the Middle Ages like this. So um, Pope Gregory um, the Ninth um, denounced it. There have been countless countless people since then questioning it and making claims that they knew somebody that was involved that where they were using either substances or chemicals today it's pretty much being claimed that they're going in there and just they're lighting the matches like anybody would light a candle um and so gene wanted to know wants to know about my feelings on this and i'm gonna i'm gonna express them right now okay uh i think the original miracle was genuine i do i think the one that i think in the in the four, fourth century I think when people did go by Christ's tomb, they did see holy light. Um, and I do think the first time in the ninth century or thereabouts, um, candles ignited by Jesus' tomb on Holy Saturday, I do think that did indeed happen. But what I think happened after that was that people never want to give up their miracles, do they? And so I think what ended up happening is um, 
they started to make claims that, oh, it's happening every year. And they were finding ways to make it happen. And then um, people would believe and it would you know, generate great numbers. Um, and even to the point that the, when, when the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was rebuilt, the new uh, Islamic leadership in Jerusalem eventually said, well, as long as you pay us, we don't care what you do. And so they were making money on it. So they didn't fight it anymore because um, the church would pay them. And, um, and then the Orthodox, some Orthodox at some point in history decided to say, oh, no, it was the Roman Catholics that, 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 that put us on to it. You know, they were the ones that, 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 uh, that told us to fake it. It was, it was a big, it's a big thing. But to this, to this day, the Orthodox Church still tends to claim. However, there has been some change in the language over the years. Very interesting. It used to be called the miracle of the holy light. If you if you go to the um, the website for the Patriarchate of Jerusalem, now they uh, they actually refer to it as uh, the a ceremony of the holy light. It's an interesting wording because uh, why would you change it for miracle, right? If it's a ceremony, that right. that implies that man's involved, right? Man is making it happen, which. I think he is. So I have never felt that the holy fire, that it, as it exists today, is a genuine miracle. Not at all. Um, but I would say, um, I would say that it is a, um, it is something that happened once, and was genuine. I just think. Christians being the way they are, don't want to ever let go of these kinds of things. And so, it, yes, I do think it's a fraud. I think, and I think it's a disgraceful fraud. I don't think it is an appropriate thing at all for clergy, high ranking clergy at that, to mislead people, even if it's with the good intentions of inspiring faith. I don't care if it's, you know, no, you don't, you don't fake miracles. You just don't do that. Um, but because it, it can be a devastating blow to faith if it ever gets found out. Um, and this is what's kind of happening right now with this lawsuit and everything else. So that's my feelings on it. Father Chris, I'm sure you probably have some thoughts on it too. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, look, the answer is I don't know whether it's a miracle or not. I, I know that um, it, it doesn't necessarily happen every year. So there, there have been years where it has not happened. Um, and, and that's part of the Orthodox narrative as well. You know, that, that they've not been, uh, that the, the, you know, the Holy Spirit has not gifted them that this year. Uh, so that's been part of their narrative as well. I think what's of crucial importance um, is miracles like this are not things that on which, upon which faith should be based. Mm -hmm. um, and and because you're right, I mean, if if people's faith is is dependent upon, oh, I prayed to God and he healed me of terminal cancer, now I'm a Christian, mm -hmm. um, or, or on the holy light in Jerusalem, then um, that's, not, that's not really faith in, in what God has revealed. Our faith should be in the Nicene Creed if we're going to be Christians. Mm -hmm. if, if we're going to be Jews, our faith should be in, you know, the God that led us out of, out of, out of slavery in Egypt uh, and so on. And so I, I think... An overemphasis on miracles is is never a great thing, um, in 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 the life of the of the pilgrim. I think that the miracles can be an encouragement for us on the way, but it, you know, by definition, miracles are things that are, that exist outside of the ordinary um, revealed world in which you know that God has provided for us. So, um, I think placing any 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 faith emphasis on the holy fire in Jerusalem is a big mistake. I like that assessment. And I mean, ultimately, we're, you know, you're right. We don't know. We're not, I'm not there. I'm not dealing with it. I'm not directly involved. I've never been to the ceremony. Um, but I've never really had good confidence in it just based upon some of the things that there have been clergy that have outed clergy saying that it's, there's matches involved or lighters. And um, there was even an interview with one of the bishops out there in the Patriarchate of Jerusalem said that, yeah, we use a lighter. Um, and, and I have, however, seen, I, I've seen, you know, on YouTube, you know, people who've been at the Holy, I've been to the Holy Sepulchre, mm -hmm. uh, not, not, not for the, um, the Holy Fire. service, but right. um, yeah, the, the, um, 
but I've seen videos of people, you know, who've, who've lit their candles from the, from the holy fl- fire who they don't get burned when they hold it to them, you know? Allegedly. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, don't know. I, I, mean I mean, I've seen, um, I've seen those videos. Um, but, you know, the problem I have with it is that, you know, they kind of go like this and it's like, yeah, yeah, I, can, yeah I can do yeah. that with a candle too and not get burned. The great, the greatest thing, miracle that I've witnessed from, from the Holy Sepulchre, there's a great documentary uh, it was done by National Geographic on the on the actual tomb of Christ, mm. uh, that and that you know they were allowed to go down into the into the original sort of cover stone, and that it is contemporary with first century um, materials. Oh, so yeah. for me, that like that scientific discovery or, or revelation, I should say. Um, uh, ought to point towards the Christian faith in a far stronger way than miraculous fire on. Oh, absolutely. I think celebration. the archeology span to that location is fantastic. Mm-hmm. And I think there's, I don't have any doubts that the whole, that the church of the Holy Sepulcher is the marks, the location of both the crucifixion and the, and the entombment. I mean, I, and that's a miracle yeah. in itself. When yeah. you think that, you know, that had to be rediscovered in the fourth century by uh, Helena, St. Helena, you know, mm-hmm. um, um, the mother of uh, Constantine. Constantine. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I just think, like for me, that's a that's a far more um, miraculous, uh, impressive thing. <laughs> fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think so too. <laughs> yeah. So, Gene, there you go. That's my answer to it. And uh, I personally, you ask my personal opinion. I don't have faith in it because I don't need faith and stuff like that. But um, I, I don't buy it. I never. I. I don't buy it. I'd like to buy it, but I don't buy it. I think the first one was real, though. I do think the first one was real. <laughs> okay, let's get to our next one. All right, uh, Brandon, what's our next question? So the next question comes on the uh, topic of how, where I saw online uh, this post that supposedly the Bible teaches certain things about hell. But to my understanding, doesn't the Bible's teachings of hell kind of inconsistent? Like it teaches... From what I remember, eternal punishment, then partial punishment, then annihilation, or just annihilation in general. Well, I mean the easy the, the, the easiest way to explain what seems like a um, a contradiction is the translation problem of English not um, having specification spe- specific different words for the different types of principles that are being uh, related here. Okay, so they. We tend to, Christians today, tend to apply the word hell to all of it, you know? So this is where we get that very Dante's Inferno concept of what Jesus would have referred to as Gehenna. Um, And then we get sort of like the distance or separation from God theological concept, which is um, very consistent with Sheol or Hades. And so we have all these different words, Greek and Hebrew, um, in, in scripture for different types of things that happen to the damned after they die. Um, but it's all, we tend to just use the word hell for all of it. So let's break down some of those differences because I think that will help to explain how they're not really inconsistencies or contradictions. So you have Hades, which is the Greek word for hell. All right, this is where we get, you know, they're the same word, okay? That's just, the, the when you say hell in Greek, it's Hades. But the concept is completely different, which is why you have in the Apostles' Creed, Jesus, you know, you know, descended into hell, the harrowing of hell that we've talked about on the show before. People are like, there's Christians like, Gee, what? Jesus went to hell? Um, yeah, I mean, that's the problem is that you, th- these are not the same concept, okay? Hades is not the same thing as what Dante's Inferno or what the typical Christian means when they say the word hell. So in Greek um, philosophy and religion, which was pagan, of course, um, it's the abode of the dead and uh, it is ruled by the God of the same name. So Hades is also a Greek God and he's sort of the God of the underworld, uh, the underworld being hell hades and it's where all the dead whether you're righteous or not go unless you get lucky and some god takes favor upon you and decides to bring you to the elysian fields and then he might you know a god might do that for you um but typically they don't and so whether you're a good person or a terrible person everybody ends up in hades it's depicted as a very dark sleep-like almost unconscious state and it's where the dead 
um, slowly dissipate. Again, both the righteous and the un- and the wicked, you know, they slowly dissipate into nothingness. Now, the Jews had almost an exactly the same kind of concept of hell. And the Hebrew word for hell is Sheol. Okay, also nothing like the Christian concept of the word. And the Hebrew word, uh, uh, Sheol, generally refers to the same characteristics as Hades, but without any of the pagan overtones. So Sheol is more of a neutral location. It's more about some undefined uh, place where um, there are varying variations in fundamental awareness. And as it slowly dissipates into unconsciousness um and again just like in the greek concept which is kind of interesting to see this parallel happening in two very different cultures but you can just see how notions of the afterlife are not fixed like we think they are or notions of religion are not fixed like we think they are and particularly in the ancient world there was much more an interchange of ideas than there is today um and so um sheol was essentially where all go this is this is this is afterlife there's no rescue from this which is why ancient judaism focused very um very strongly on the the um the here and now and god favored you if he blessed you it's because he was going to do it now in this life because there wasn't any afterlife to go to until Jesus comes along and throws all of the Jewish world on its head with this idea that now there can be something beyond that. Now, of course, by the time we get to the first first century, even without Jesus, Jewish notions of the afterlife had started to evolve. There started to be talk about the res- of a resurrection of the dead, even without Jesus. Okay, Jesus was just the first one to actually do it, but um, it was really kind of a, a, a an idea that had started to evolve that maybe there was a way out of Sheol. I think that was actually the Holy Spirit sort of guiding people to the revelation that was to come, which is why I think you see around the time of Jesus, all of a sudden this starts to happen. But historians, very secular historians, will say it's the opposite: is that Jesus was influenced by his by the time in which he lived, and so if he talked a lot about the resurrection. And apocalypticism, it's because that's what was going on in Judaism at the time. Fair enough. Either argument could be made, whether you prefer the academic one or the more um, uh, faithful answer is kind of beyond the point. The point is, know that Sheol and Hades both mean hell. And when the Bible talks about hell, that's what it's talking about. Sheol and Hades. It's not talking about the, this place with pitchforks and torture and, you know, and, and, and fire and all this stuff. Where do we get that notion? It comes from J- Jesus when he starts making Gehenna. parallels to Gehenna, which was a trash dump and also kind of a place where they would throw criminals too to be burned. And they, they, anybody that was an undesirable, you know, when they died, they, they'd cast them out there too. But it was mostly for trash because they saw criminals as trash, kind of like the way people do today. And so um, this was where you go and you burn the trash. You get rid of it, right? You burn it to get rid of it. And so Christ's analogy is based on what happens when people fail to achieve salvation. So what he's saying is that, and this is, a, this is the very important implication here, is that Gehenna is the reality post-resurrection of the dead. And that's the key point. It is not something that happens as soon as you die from a human vantage point. What it is, is that when you die, if you're wicked as hell, or if you're, if you're just like the most saintly person, everyone is going to go to Sheol, okay? At the end of time, the, both the righteous and the unrighteous will resurrect. And so at that point, they will, this is why we call it judgment day, they, their virtues will be weighed, assuming they have any. And the, those that did not cultivate grace, did not achieve salvation, we call them the damned, they will be thrown into the fires of Gehenna, all right? And the whole idea of the gnashing of teeth and, you know, because the wailing and gnashing of teeth as Jesus describes it, and you might say, well, that's where, that's hell, and that's eternal. No, the, what's eternal about hell, 
Okay, now this is not this is not standard Catholic or Christian theology. This is esoteric Christian theology now. Okay, I want to make that distinction. But this church does not teach that hell is an eternal condition in a sense that you will be burning for all eternity in the fires of Gehenna. What it means is, and I, I can prove it because the next one here will prove it. Um, what it means is that if you were just went thrown into Sheol without the resurrection, then you just slowly dissipate into unconsciousness. All right. Yeah. You'd still eventually fade into nothing. It's kind of like being burnt up, but you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't be aware of it. The real tragedy here is that at the resurrection of the dead, you will be reconstituted with the same fundamental awareness and consciousness you have now because your body returns, your brain returns. This is what Christian theology teaches, okay? And you will then have to face your annihilation. You will have to face that. And yes, that will be terrifying. That will be painful. And the worst part about it is not, is not that you having to undergo, undergo that pain. The worst part about it is that you will have full knowledge that you're the one who sent yourself there. That's the real torture of hell. That you could have done one simple thing differently and it could have changed everything. Cultivate grace. But because you lacked that grace and you didn't do anything about it, you didn't care about it, you didn't value it in life, now you're faced with this. That's the true tragedy of it. That's the horror of it. And that's what Jesus is trying to say in this analogy, but it's still parable-esque. When he says Gehenna, it's a parable of that trash dump, okay? There's not a place out there called Gehenna that God created for the damned. That's not what Jesus is saying. Then we get one last analogy, actually two more, that's referred to in the, in, in the book of Revelation as the lake of fire, all right? This is the apocalyptic name for Gehenna. It's the final annihilation of everyone and everything that continues to belong to the old heaven and the old earth, which is the damned humans and fallen angels alike. They all get wiped out because they belong to the fallen creation, which is going to be destroyed and they will be destroyed with it. Not because God wants to destroy them with it, but that there is no place for anything imperfect in the new heaven and the new earth. They're incompatible. If, you, if he would allow one person to enter into the new heaven and the new earth who is still imperfect, it would fall all over again. And that's not God's plan. That is not God's will. And it's like a fire because it is a complete wipeout. And you'd say, well, say, well, no, that's not what it means. Yes, it is what it means. Read it. Okay. Because there's another reference in the book of Revelation, the second death. Why do we call it the second death? Because you're resurrected from the dead and now you're going to die again when you shouldn't. The resurrected should be eternal, but only the grace of salvation makes that possible. Okay? If you don't have the grace of salvation, then the resurrection of the dead will happen, and then you're going to die all over again because you're going to stay with the old heaven and the old earth, which is going to pass away with you. Okay? All of this refers, is all called hell in Christian theology. And they make it worse by saying that human souls are eternal and immortal by nature, which they're not. They are not. That is not good. I'm sorry. I, I know I'm going against the magisterium on this one, but there is no way that you can go through what Judaism taught and see a progressive succession to where we get to this point, you can clearly see the embellishments that were made um, in, in, or in a, and around after, very soon after the fathers of the church, which became fundamental thinking in the dark ages. Okay. But if you take it from the way it is in the, just taking it for face value, there were definitely some fathers of the church that taught that the soul was in, innately immortal, but there were many that didn't. There were many that didn't. And, um, and that's because of this, because of this, this understanding. Um, so yes, they're metaphors, but they're very literal metaphors. We wouldn't call them the second death. Now the Catholic church today would say, oh, the second death is your, that's your spiritual death. No, it's not saying that. It's not saying that because if you have to, if you do believe, if you do believe that the new heaven and the new earth is a reality, an actual 
reality that's going to happen, not a metaphor, okay, then you have to accept that that's going to be destroyed and everything that stays with it is going to be destroyed too. There's no place for hell in this new heaven and new earth. There's no place to keep a hell somewhere. The entire universe is going to be, it's kind of like reset. <laughs> if you can call it um, Garden of Eden 2.0, it's going to be reset. There's nowhere for any, what is he going to do? Have two universes now? You know, two realities, one broken, one not. That's not the perfection of God. The perfection of God is to bring things back into wholeness. So philosophically, it can't be reconciled, this notion of an eternal hell where people perish and are tortured forever, uh, even if it is at their own hands. I think the torture is the realization that you didn't have to go through it, and now you have to because you, you missed your chance, and it's your fault, and you'll know it's your fault. You won't be able to blame God or scapegoat him into being like, you should have been, you know, you should have saved me. You should have, you should have, you should have been more present. You should have made it more e easier for me to believe. You know, that's how humans think. In that moment, you'll know how culpable you are. And that's going to be a horrific thing. That is going to be fires of Gehenna enough. Annihilation is going to feel good compared to realizing that. You're going to want annihilation once you realize that. You're not going to want to live with that. Okay, so... I think that's why there looks like there's, there's discrepancy there. Now I'm giving you an esoteric Christian interpretation. Like I said, the Catholic Church would interpret this differently. They see the second death as a spiritual thing. They see the, the soul as immortal. Um, they see hell as a permanent condition. Um, and I, I just don't see how you can extrapolate that unless you're, you're just going on medieval sources. But if you're looking at the Jewish sources and you're looking at the, the, the way the fathers of the church taught about, and which is why I think orthodoxy is more in line with our thinking than Catholicism is, because Catholicism was very influenced by the Middle Ages and orthodoxy was more influenced by the fathers of the church. And they kept to that more ancient um, doctrine, in my opinion. I mean, you know, there's going to be disputes on this. There's no theologian that's going to agree 100% uh, on this kind of stuff because ultimately we don't know. The Bible's not about going to hell. The Bible's about salvation, <laughs> okay? Hell's just, just in passing, it says, well, here's your consequence. But let's not focus on that. There's salvation here. You don't have to worry about that. Focus on salvation. Then you don't have to worry about that. That's why the Bible doesn't talk that much about hell because it's not really relevant to the Bible. What's relevant to the Bible is salvation, Okay. Uh, Father Chris, any thoughts of your own on this one? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I entirely agree with everything you said, uh, but I do agree. I do agree with the, with what are fundamental points, which are uh, first of all the the self imposition of hell. You mm -hmm. know that that hell is, I mean, as Fulton Sheen described, eternal self unforgiveness for having rejected divine love, which is a, a really good description of, uh, and that's why we can be in that hell now. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean. The difference is, is that we, we can get out of it now. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we can, we can choose because what leads us to, you know, the other thing I wanted to say connected to what I was just about to say is there's one line in the creed dedicated to the idea of hell. One line, uh, he descended into hell. That, that's it. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, uh, um, because you're right, the, the, the focus of the church is not to try and describe, um, the consequences have, of having rejected divine love. Mm -hmm. the, the the purpose of the church is to gather people into that divine love. In in other words, to not to give people the means of grace because only God does, does that. Mm -hmm. But to, but to um, explain, open up, and make available um, the decision to choose divine grace. Because uh, the the remedy is to place our faith in Christ, the God Man. Uh, uh, and in order to do that, we have to um, rid ourselves of pride, which is, which is the the fundamental sin that leads us to hell. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that you know we, our, our intellect is so superior to the notion of a god that we can't possibly believe in him. You know, uh, I've got to be convinced. I need, I need more holy fires, and I need you know all those sorts of things. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. And so, so I, I think that, um, I, I, and for a lot of people, they can't get over themselves, and that's why the church. Uh, has developed sacraments uh, in order to help that to happen. And so um, confession puts forgiveness of sins beyond an opinion. 
um, uh, baptism uh, puts the, the the state of man uh, right with God, regardless of what you think or not. Um, and so, uh, in the in the Eucharist, we're fed by the body and blood of Christ, whatever your opinion is. Um, and so, that's the purpose of the church is actually to offer concrete ways that we would otherwise find very difficult to do spiritually, mm-hmm. you know, or, or intellectually. Our intellect gets in the way a lot of the time. In in many ways, the higher IQ, the worse off you are um, it, it, with regards to that. And so, um, so the purpose of the church isn't, isn't to, isn't to dwell on um, hell other than to say that hell must be terrible. And that's all we need to know. Really. Hell must, hell must be something we don't want to aim for, you know? <laughs> um, and so that, you know, that's the main the main purpose of, of 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 so we you know when you say achieve grace I understand what you mean by that um, but of course it's God who's achieved that grace for us and so we achieve it only by submission to to um, uh, the to understanding the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah, I I try to always make sure that people understand that um, grace is a free gift. It is unmerited yeah. gift. We can't earn it, but yeah. you can and absolutely cultivate it. It's 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 sort of like, look, I can come over to your house and bring you, you know, a dozen donuts. That's my gift to you. But if you don't choose to eat the donuts, then the gift is wasted. I still gave it to you. It's still free, but you still have to choose to go and get them. You have to go and get the plate. You got to go and put your choices on that plate and enjoy them. That's what I mean by cultivation of grace is that you have to cultivate the gift that's given to you. You can't just simply sit on it and say, oh, I got it now. And then just look at it. That doesn't do any good for you. And so the grace of salvation has to, you have to do something with it to use a gospel analogy to reap what we have not sowed yes exactly yeah yeah you know god has sowed this uh and we get to reap it and 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 i understand like for a lot of people that's actually yeah and this is not prideful um for a lot of people that's the most difficult thing to accept yes is that is 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 if if god did this if god humiliated himself to becoming a dog, basically becoming a man. Um, and, and the fruit of that was to lay down his life so that all men could be saved because he loved us so much. That's a, that is like, that is such an amazing concept mm-hmm. that people find that genuinely difficult to believe. Like, I'm not talking about atheists. I'm talking about theists, people that, could, right. that, that, that are willing to believe there is a God, but the idea that that God would do what we believe he has done is actually, yes. you know, I mean, we, we get we get numb to it, but it's actually enormous. That is an enormous um, uh, idea, you know. Mm-hmm. It sure Sorry, is, Jamie. It's hard to wrap your head around it. Yeah, I don't think you can actually. I think that's yeah. like, like you say. All you can do is is say, "I'll I'll receive it. I'll receive it. I yes, can't. I, and that's, I, can't, I can't even understand it, but I'll receive it." And that's the cultivation. That's the cultivation part because yeah. you, you it, it's very difficult for a human being to to choose to pursue something that they don't understand. Mm-hmm. And and that's where the work comes in. I mean, that is an effort. That is almost something you have to merit in a way, in a way. Um, because, yes, the gift itself is free. But not knowing what to do with it, not knowing how to use it, not knowing if it's even worth your time, having to trust someone else's word that it is, that is an effort. That is an effort for human beings to have to do. And so when I say cultivate grace, that's what I mean. It's just so that, you know, if there's any theologians out there that are like, oh, this guy's nuts. No, I know. I understand the theology. Um, I might have a unique way of talking about it, but I try to bring it down to a way that people can understand it. I have always said grace is free and unmerited. I, the, but, the other thing I just want to quickly say about hell is, yeah. is we're all we're, just from a, from a, um, historical theological and linguistic point of view is there's kind there's also two hangups that, that are fruits of the history of the church. One, one of course is the reformation where the idea of purgatory became, um, well, it, First was firstly abused by by the Roman Catholic Church system mm-hmm. to make an economy a, a financial economy out of it, but secondly, then I think rejected uh, too uh, um, casually by um, Luther and and those that that followed. Um, so I think there's one hang up there because I I I, I could almost see Hades and purgatory being 
quite similar concepts. Um, I think they are. Actually, I think Hades and Sheol uh, yeah. is where purgatory plays out. I do too. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when Jesus says to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise, he means Hades. Mm hmm Sorry, I mean shale. So, um, by the way, everyone everyone remembers the thief that was saved. That they also they forget there was another one that that wasn't. That wasn't. <laughs> it's all right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. The thief on the cross. One one was saved. One was damned. Mm -hmm. But what damned him? What damned him? He did. It was it, he did his unwillingness. That's yeah, right. his un and that's the yeah. cultivation. Um, See, that's the, that that was grace freely given. There is Jesus in that moment, ready to give it, and he didn't want it. Didn't want to use it. No. You know, and the, and the second thing I'd say is that is that when and you use the, the term magisterium uh, of the church, we we also believe that that um, the scriptures have authority because the church gave them authority. Mm -hmm. um, so th there is often a kind of reversal that goes on, especially amongst Protestantism, for obvious reasons. I'm not I'm not attacking Protestants. I, I'm just explaining it. Um, that that it's almost as though the King James version of the Bible was thrown down from heaven by God. <laughs> Um, yeah. and, and then, then you base an entire religion on it and it's not, tr I, I, it's why it's insufficient is what is why I know many of our viewers, um, come to us from that tradition, like Brandon with all sorts of reasonable, legitimate questions that they've never found any answers to. Mm -hmm. uh, and now don't get right. me wrong. Sometimes the answer is ultimately, yes, it's, it's the mystery of God, but there are answers that we can uh, oh, sorry, that we can um, explore that have been explored. And, uh, and that's the job of the magisterium of the church. So so just because uh, an idea comes from um, the development of, of the church throughout time doesn't mean that it's of lesser significance or less true. Often it can be more true. Um, you, you know, we know, for example, that uh, uh, Isaac Newton's uh, scientific discoveries became somewhat less true and somewhat more true in the light of Einstein. And so um, just because something comes first doesn't mean it's necessarily the, the purest and best version of itself. Um, and so, you know, what the church teaches has, has, has varying degrees of authority attached to it. Um, That's a hard so, part for, for non-Catholics to truly understand, yeah. honestly. It really is. It's a hard yeah. one for them to wrap their heads around. All right. I want to get to the last question. Um, we got about, five or six minutes here. So what's the last one? So actually, I don't think we'll be able to get to the last question because uh, Don on Facebook asked a really good follow-up question to the second one. Uh, she asked actually multiple, but we can only get to one. Okay. Uh, she said, I might have missed what you're saying. So if someone does wrong to anyone, do they go to hell? Or is it true that when you die, you experience what you have done wrong for you to get into heaven? I think you'll know what you've done, but it's not about what you've done wrong. It's about what you failed to make right. And that's the issue. You know, there's no sin that's, that's, that's unforgivable except the sin of refusing, uh, refusing forgiveness. God cannot forgive you if you freely choose not to accept his, his forgiveness. That's what condemns you. Ask it. It will be given to you. Yeah. Not it. It will be open. Exactly. You know, so the only thing it. that sends anyone to hell is refusing to accept God's forgiveness. That's it. There's no sin you can commit, no matter how horrific, that will send you to hell. Only that sends you to hell. I, I think she was describing something a bit more either either karma based or or pagan yeah, based. Yes, because one of her you know? comments did talk about uh, karma. We don't believe in karma. You see, karma says um, you reap what you sow. Mm -hmm. Christianity says you reap what you did not sow. Karma says mm -hmm. uh, if you do something wrong, it will come back to you. Mm -hmm. Christianity says you did something wrong, God died for you. So it's a very, very different concept. Very different. These, you know, and now karma is casually used by people in the West uh, who, who might even think of themselves as Christians. Uh, but but karma is nothing. It, it couldn't be further removed from Christian theology. I mean, there's a truth I to it in the sense. It, there's a truth to it in the sense that there is a causal relationship to things. You, you there there is consequence to action, mm -hmm. and so yes, it damages your own conscience. Negative yes. actions do produce negative results, and vice versa. 
The thing yeah. though about Christianity is that the grace of God can reverse the effects of that. That's how he conquers death because the consequence, the not the natural karmic result of falling from grace. Okay. Falling from per, per, uh, perfection is death. That's just natural consequence. You could say that's karma. Okay. But Jesus turns it up uh, upside on its head by reversing the entire process. In fact, everything Jesus does is through reversal, you know? Uh, and so, yes, everything Father Chris said there is absolutely correct and, and true because it fundamentally changes how, what we deserve um, because, and it's done out of love. And that's the difference. And honestly, there is no religion in the world, not one, that gives us a tangible means of experiencing God's love. Not one. Not one. And so, yeah, in fact, I mean, we're going to talk about God. Epicurus tonight. Epicurus, was, we talked about the gods, and you're going to find that pagans didn't have the kind of relationship with their gods that neo-pagans think they do today. All right? It's, uh, Thank a, it's, God we don't get what we deserve. Uh, Thank <laughs> God we don't get exactly. what we deserve. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we'd all we would all perish, right? We would all perish. Um, is the last question that you missed there, Brendan? Is it is it a quick one to answer? Uh, very quickly, uh, I know the Bible says to honor. Oh, this comes from Tammy on the network. Uh, I know the Bible says to honor your mother and father, but what do you do when your mother is a narcissist? Okay. Um, yes. Honor doesn't mean agree or obey. It, it, correct. That's a short answer. And it's also you still your mama. And it's also you pray for her. The right. Old Testament is superseded because it's fulfilled in Christ. Right? It's superseded by what Jesus then commanded Himself, in the sense that it becomes the next, um, the, the next iteration of the law of God. In the sense that then Jesus reduces it down all to one: love one another as I have loved you. And when a mother. Narcissism is, is the direct opposite of showing love. It's about manipulation. It's about control. That is not love. So when your mother is expressing an anti-love towards you, she's not following the commandment of Christ, which is much more important than anything that came before it, okay? Because in a way, the Ten Commandments are really all about love too. And, and that's why Jesus can make it very simple. But he also gives us something else that I think is even more important. And I'll leave you with this thought, okay? Jesus said, and if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Cut it off. If it is, be it is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And this is, he's talking about Gehenna again, right? Um, the fact of the matter is, okay, a narcissistic, a narcissistic mother who you keep this toxic relationship with is going to cause both of you an occasion to sin. You are doing a far better thing by removing such toxic people from your life than it would be to try to make this work because you're trying to honor some ancient law that has been superseded by love, okay? The, those things do not apply. The honor father and mother does not apply when there is no relationship of love there. It assumes that there's already love. It assumes that the parent loves the child and then the child needs to reciprocate that. Um, but when the, mother, when the parent doesn't even love the child, then the child is not obligated to, to reciprocate that. The child is obligated to protect themselves. And nobody, nobody under any circumstances, even in the church where divorce, for example, is condemned, okay? You never keep a toxic person in your life ever. God does not want that of you. There is no law or sacrament that is more important than your salvation. And if you, if you try to make something work that is toxic and killing you both spiritually, that is going to do much more harm than if you just agree to go your separate ways and live your own lives. And that way you can't sin against each other anymore. That is better. Okay. That's my thought on it. We're going to come back and talk about the Epicurious Paradox in just about seven minutes or so. Take a nice break there, get yourself a drink, go to the bathroom, we'll be right back after this.
Welcome back, everybody, to the second part of Vestiges After Dark. And we're going to now start our discussion on tonight's topic, um, basically shattering the Epicurean paradox. We'll talk about the nature of theodicy, which is really what we're discussing, actually, theologically tonight. Um, and then um, it should be shorter. This is going to be a shorter segment, I think. I don't think I'm going to need the whole hour. And then after that, we'll take one more break. And then we'll come back with the whole panel and discuss. And take your questions, too. Don't go away. Okay, everybody, you know, I was just thinking some people sometimes say when they hear the more esoteric interpretation of hell, esoteric Christian interpretation of hell that I give, uh, that I teach, um, they're like, well, but, but, but it's set, it makes it very clear that, that hell is eternal. In fact, the, the Catholic Church defines hell as eternal separation from God. Well, I don't know about you, but that sounds like annihilation to me. Remember, Thomas Aquinas said that, and the Roman Catholic Church largely accepts this metaphysical explanation, that if the presence of God were to leave anything for just a moment, it would cease to exist. Well, if you're eternally separated from God completely in every possible way, which is what they say hell is, well, that would, by default, by Thomas Aquinas' own definition, would mean you don't exist anymore. Thus, why I say it's annihilation. I could go on and on and on about that. And that's not really the subject of tonight. Not really. A little bit. <laughs> not really. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and get started with this. And then we'll bring the panel back. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll uh, try to be brief. Because there's really not much to talk about. Uh, there's more to discuss than I think there's much to teach about this. But it is a bit of a teaching lesson. So here we go. Are we ready? tonight, the Epicurean paradox. So let's discuss a little bit about what this is first, and then we'll break down what it really is, okay, so that we have a good understanding of it. Um, in theology, this is called theodicy. This is the, the attempt to reconcile through theology the existence of evil um, with the belief that God is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent. Okay, so basically what that means is that he's all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving. Okay, all-good. And that's what Christianity teaches God is, right? So the idea is how does evil fit in to a God that is those three characteristics that Christianity teaches he is? So Christianity teaches that evil exists, okay? And it also teaches that God is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent. So this became associated with Epicurus because, um, now let's be clear, uh, Epicurus never, never um, um, came up with this breakdown that we're about to explore as the paradox. This came from uh, a Christian author. He associated it with some of the Epicurean thinking. Um, his name was um, Lactan. Uh, Lact Lactantius, Lactantius, <laughs> Lactantius, these names can kill you. And after, uh, you know, after Holy Week, my mouth isn't really working all that great. In fact, I was like, I was watching last week's episode. I noticed that when I introduced the show, I, I said it was 2023. <laughs> 
I was already too tired and I hadn't even started Holy Week yet. Um, at least I got the date right today, but no, um, uh, Tactanius. Okay. He was an early Christian author about 252 to 325 AD. Um, and he, he used the Epicurean philosophy, because Epicurus was a Greek philosopher, a pagan Greek philosopher, um, to sort of formulate this paradox with the problem of evil. Okay. So atheists like this one because it kind of proves in their mind and their thinking that, well, you can't have it both ways. That's the paradox that you can't have a world where evil exists, but also have an omnis omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent God. That's what atheists say. And that's also um, what the paradox says. So that's why they like it. Um, but I'm going to break it down. I'm going to, I'm going to solve it actually for you. And, um, you know, I'm going to use Christianity as a starting point, but I don't need Christianity to do it. We, we can actually use Buddhism so that the atheists um, can see that this is not really your best argument against the existence of God. Okay. Because Epicurus himself was not an atheist. He was a pagan. He believed that the gods, as I said earlier, the gods do exist. He just believed they don't give a damn. So he would say that evil exists because they don't, they could do something about it. They just don't want to, which means they're not omnibenevolent, right? They just don't care is what he thought. So just live your life and don't be, you know, don't worry about the fact that you're going to die and become nothing because that's how they saw Hades. Remember annihilation? Hell is annihilation. I'm telling you, if you look at it from the ancient world, if you look at it from history, you're not going to be able to see it through the lens of the Middle Ages anymore. I, I'm, I'm sorry, you just won't. Um, and I'm, unfortunately, I'm just too, I'm too immersed in ancient history to be able to get into the medievalism of it. But that's besides the point. Let's talk about this now. Okay, so what's the Epicurean po paradox? So I'm going to give you, I'm going to posit to you the succession here of questions. And then we're going to answer them each way. Okay. Um, so let me actually bring it up on my screen. I can't, I don't think I can bring it up on, no, I can't bring this up on your screen. So that's okay. Okay. Here we go. Evil exists. Do we all agree? I think so. I think we can all agree evil exists. Okay. Um, there's no way to deny that i mean bad things happen right you get child molesters out there you got murderers you got rapists um you've got disease you've got suffering poverty all of these things are evil you've got selfishness and greed all of it's evil okay imperfection itself evil is evil so we, we, we can't deny that evil exists. So no one's going to say, does evil exist? No, no, it doesn't. Of course it does. Of course it does. At least what we call evil. Now, maybe you might say that there's not an intrinsic evil in the universe. I mean, we could have a discussion about that. We could philosophize about that. Absolutely. Is there an intrinsic evil? But what human beings call evil absolutely does exist. Okay, so we can just leave it at that. Okay, so the basic definition of evil I think we all, every single person can agree that, yeah, suffering exists, uh, crime exists, atrocity exists, all of that stuff, okay? So the first question, it says, can God prevent evil? Well, is he omnipotent? Omnipotent meaning he can do anything. Can God prevent evil? Well, if you say no to that, then that would mean God's not all-powerful. So that would immediately discredit one of the tenets that Christianity teaches about God. So that means the Christian has to say, yes, God can prevent evil. Christian has to say it. He, does, he can't say no to that question because then you're, then you're claiming that God's not omnipotent. We can't claim that because we do claim he's omnipotent. So we have to say yes to that question. Can God prevent evil? So yes, evil exists. Yes, God can, can prevent it. Okay, so that brings us to the next question. Does God know all the evil? So the question is that maybe the reason why some things, like some people seem to come out unscathed, like 
we've talked about miracles and things that happen. Um, and then some people, you know, really good people, bad things happen to them. There's even books written about why do good things, why do bad things happen to good people? Okay. So does God know about all the evil? Well, the Christian can't say no, because if you say no to that, then that means God's not all knowing, meaning he's not omniscient. But a Christian has to say he is omniscient because that's one of the characteristics we know about God as Christians. Okay. So yes, the answer to that is yes, God does know about all the evil. So you can't say that the evil that happens is because God's not seeing it or God doesn't know about it. You have to accept that yeah, he does see it. He watches it happen. And then you're, you're, then, then you're left with the next question. Does God want to prevent evil? Okay, because then you could say, well, the only, if, he knows that it, if he knows all the evil that happens, he watches everything happen because he's omniscient. He sees everything, all seeing and all knowing. And he has the power because he's omnipotent, all powerful to prevent it. Then... Maybe he doesn't want to prevent it. And so then if we say no to that, then that would mean that God's not all good or not all loving. So he's not omnibenevolent because an omnibenevolent, an all loving God could not watch a child be tortured. An all loving God could not sit there and watch with his omniscient, omnipotent ability. Could you ask yourself that question? If you were omnipotent and omniscient, could you just sit by and watch somebody murder a child? Could you? I don't think any one of us could say yes to that. Yet the Christian understanding of God says he does see this and he does know about it and he allows it to happen. So the question is then posed does God want to prevent evil? Because why wouldn't he stop it? So if we say no to that, then it means he's not all loving. That's where Epicurus stopped. He said that the reason that all evil happens, that the gods can see all this and they could do something about it if they wanted to, they just don't care. But is that the Christian God though? It's all right for the pagan gods to feel this way, but is that the Christian God? No, that's not what we know of the Christian God. It's not even really what we know of the Jewish one, really. I mean, really, it's not. If we're going to like separate the two, which they're not, of course, separate, but you know, uh, Jewish people might not see them as the same. Um, so does God want to prevent evil? So then let's say yes. Let's say yes to that. Christian has to say yes, right? Because he is all loving. So this is another time where the Christian can't say no. Because <laughs> you say no to the first one, he's not all powerful. You say no to the second one, he's not all knowing. You say no to the third one, then he's not all loving. So we have to say yes. Does God want to prevent evil? Yes. Then the, comes the next question, the paradox. Then why is there evil? You, can't, you have to answer that question. So the paradox gives us three uh, or four possible answers to this one. And all of them go back into the paradox. You might be like, well, how are you going to solve this? Well, I'll show you. Okay. We'll do it the Christian way first, and then I'll do it the Buddhist way for the atheists that, you know, need that. Because remember, remember, Buddhism is really not, it's not really atheism, but Buddhism doesn't really have a, a God in it. God's not, God or gods are not important to Buddhism. Buddha wanted to transcend it all. He saw all of it as unnecessary. He wanted to go beyond it. So nirvana is, in, in, in Buddhist thinking, nirvana is even beyond the gods. Okay? Um, and so, for an atheist, that might be atheist, atheistic enough, you know, to say, oh, well, that argument makes more sense to me than the Christian one. And fair enough, it might. Um, this is actually one of the reasons why, when I get to it, why I've said to you before that Christianity did not make sense to me until I became Buddhist, the Epicurean paradox. It's the same thing that Bart Ehrman, as I talked about him before, a wonderful biblical scholar who was a, you know, evangelical Christian who now is agnostic. Uh, he's agnostic because he couldn't get past, you know, things like children being hurt. Most of us can't. 
Most of us can't accept that. Who could stand by and watch that? What kind of God would do that? So he couldn't deal with it. He couldn't deal with it. Um, and in my early years, I couldn't either. Okay, I couldn't, I couldn't understand, I couldn't rationalize God sitting there being able to do something and not doing anything about it. Then why is there evil? So let's look at some of these possibilities. Um, well, one of the questions that some Christians might give you is to test us. God wants to test us, right? That's, I want to test your faith. So a lot of Protestants in particular get told this one. You know, when, when, when they, it's like, why did this bad thing happen? You know, why did mommy die in a car accident? The pastor says, well, sometimes God's test us. Bullshit. That's bullshit. And I'll tell you why it's bullshit. Because if God needed to test us, then that would mean he is not all knowing, right? If God's all knowing, he would know what to do. If we were tested, he'd know the answer. He'd know the result before he tested us. So there's no reason to test us because he already knows the outside. He doesn't need to test us. He already knows what we're going to do. He's omniscient. So if you say no to that one, then you go back to, then he's not omniscient. He needs to test us because he's not all knowing. And that violates the description of God. Okay. So does that one work? So then the next one, what's the next one that the Protestants like to give? And this is one that the Catholics give too. Although the Catholics do the testing thing too. They do that as well. I've heard it. I've heard it growing up. Um, Satan, Satan's the next one. And Satan causes the evil. It's not God that wants to, to, to people to suffer and hurt, get hurt. No, it's Satan that hurts them. Okay, then an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God would destroy Satan. Just get rid of them. Right? So if he's not destroying Satan, then it gets us back into, well, then maybe he's not all loving. Maybe he's not all knowing. Maybe he's not all powerful because maybe he doesn't have the power to stop Satan. Maybe he's not, he doesn't know what Satan's doing. Maybe he does, he's not really all that good. So if you say, that, if you say it's Satan, then that poses that problem. So it can't be Satan. It can't be to test us. Then what is it? Well, another one is it's necessary for the universe to exist. In order for the universe to exist, there has to be a contrast between the light and the dark. Now we're getting somewhere. Now we're getting somewhere. That makes some sense, right? We've talked about polarity and duality. We've talked about binary code and bilateral symmetry. There does seem to be a passive aggress a, a, a passive aggress a passive and active principle in the universe. There is yin and yang. Okay? So and the foundation of our reality is based upon this contrast. So we're getting somewhere. That's not a bad one to to answer, but it does continue to feed into the paradox, unfortunately, which we'll see here. The other thing you could say is that maybe there's another reason that we don't know. Well, that's also getting somewhere because there is another reason that you don't know, but it's not quite what you think it is. It's not that God's allowing it. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, we'll talk about it. So is it necessary for the universe to exist? Well, maybe, but not really. And is there another reason? Well, sort of, but not really. But let's say, for example, we use those because the other ones don't work. Testing us does not work because he's, we know he's omniscient. So he doesn't need to test us because he already knows the outcome before we would do it. So the test means nothing. And it can't be Satan because we know he can destroy Satan. Okay, so we have to go with these other two. Is it necessary for the universe to exist? And is there another reason perhaps? Well, they both come to the same next step. Those two, questions, those two answers come to the next pot, part of the paradox then if it's necessary for the universe to exist or if there's some other reason that we don't know, then could God have then created a universe without these needs? So whatever that mysterious thing is that we don't know, that mysterious reason, or if it is necessary for the universe to exist, that evil has to be a part of it, then could God have created a universe without that condition? 
Well, the answer to that, if we say no, brings us unfortunately right back to then he's not all powerful. He's not omnipotent because an omnipotent God can do anything, which means that an omnipotent God could have created a universe without evil. He doesn't need to exist if God decides to manufacture it that way, right? Omnipotent, right? Can do anything. And even if there's another reason that we don't know, well, he could have created a universe that way that reason doesn't have any bearing to prevent evil from happening. So he doesn't have to sit there and watch children get slaughtered. Like it's happening out there in, uh, in Palestine and in Israel. Okay, could have created a world without that. He's, all, he's omnipotent. So if God could have created a universe without this, the Christian once again has to say yes. Then it comes to the next question. Then why didn't he? Why didn't he create a universe that does not need evil? Well, if you say it could bring you back to, to test us, but you can't use that one. We already went that way. Because if you say it's to test us, then that would mean that he's not omniscient because he already knows. There's no reason to test us if he already knows. So then we get to, then why didn't he create a universe that doesn't need evil to exist? Because it kind of does. Yin and Yang is a real thing. Okay, contrast is a real thing. And there's meaning to that. That's the best answer, but it still gets us to where, well, then why didn't God create a universe where you don't need that condition? Well, then the only answer left, if you're a Christian, is free will. Sounds good, doesn't it? Free will. It's, of course, it's human freedom. And it's not wrong. But it does pose another problem to the paradox. Because if we answer free will, which the only answer left is free will, meaning man chooses freely to commit evil and atrocity, which we do, which we do. It's not God's will, it's our will. Then could God have created a universe with free will, but without evil? And if the answer is no, then he's not all powerful again. He's not omnipotent. If the answer is yes, then you circle right back to, then why didn't he? and you get stuck in that loop forever. That's the, that's the end of the paradox. Then why didn't he create a world without these? Free will. Well, but it, could God have created a universe without free will and still, um, and, 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 and could God have created a universe with free will but still get rid of evil? Yes. Then why didn't he? That's the end of the paradox. And atheists are very content with it stopping there. Um, but we're not going to stop there. We're going to answer that because that's where it is. Okay. Is the answer free will? Yes, it is. I'm going to give you the, I'm going to but but the problem is free will doesn't have to lead back to then. Why didn't he? Because here's the, here's the, here's the real clincher. Okay. God did create a universe with free will without evil. That's how it started. What happened was we chose evil right? We did freely. We brought evil into the universe. The universe was not created with evil. In fact, I would even go as far as to say is that the universe in which you live now is not even God's creation anymore. It's yours. That's why there has to be a new heaven and a new earth. He has to create it again. One that is perfected because this one has become our corruption. And you might say, well, then how does he sit there and watch all this evil? Right? Well, it's not quite like that for God. Because there's this little thing, and this is where the paradox falls apart. The paradox depends upon one God does not, and that is linear time. In order for this paradox to work, it has to be linear, because you have to say, if this, then that. That's a past and a future right? It, it's, these are all if-then statements. They're linear statements. God is not a linear being. God does not exist in linear time. And God's universe and his reality was never linear. 
this is also why we have to accept hell as annihilationism because of the linear problem too, but that's too metaphysical for tonight. So we're not going to do, we're not going to go there. We could go there on the third hour. Maybe if I don't get blown away, like the wicked witch of the, of the West, but we'll see how this goes. Okay. So far we got a nice stable connection. We're going to, we're going to keep it going. All right. So free will. All right. So did God create a universe without free will? Yes, he did. He did. He, he did. He absolutely did. Uh, I'm sorry, a universe with free will but without evil. Excuse me. Did God create a universe with free will but without evil? Yes, he did. But the problem is our free will chose to create the evil, and so we created a fallen universe, and that's the one we live in now. So then let's go back and say, well, what, how, how does he allow this, right? Because then it doesn't that, it, it, it solves the why didn't he part because he, we already know he did. But it doesn't create the section, the, the, it, it takes us back to the beginning of the paradox where it's like, well, does God know about all the evil? Well, yeah, he watches it. Okay, so then why doesn't God prevent the evil? Well, he did that too. He did that too, that's the cross. Okay. And the problem with the Epicurean paradox is because it's a linear problem and because we as human beings are linear beings, the issue then is that we expect that God is sitting and watching painstakingly each moment unfold like we are. No, for God, it's already resolved. It's done. And honestly, for us too, we just haven't caught up with it yet. Our realization prevents us from it. So God is not watching the atrocities. They're not happening anymore. In fact, I would even say this is where it's going to get really kind of ugh, sketchy for some of you conventionalists out there. I would even say that the atrocities never really actually happened. All of the evils that we think we're seeing are not really happening. They're all an illusion because we're an illusion. Falling from grace was not that we corrupted the universe. That's the archetypal story of it. That's the story we tell ourselves to understand it. But in truth, in actuality, in the divine understanding that God has, that's not what happened at all. What we decided to do is we decided to reject the truth of God for the illusion of man. And that's what we live within. And so all the atrocities that we create are dreams. And God's awake. We're not. This is why Sheol and Hades are likened to a dreamlike state or a sleep state. Because in reality, that's the only natural conclusion is to just succumb to the illusion. And that's where we get to Buddhism. Because what does Buddhism teach about reality? Well, Buddhism teaches this, that teaches us that the reason that they're, because both, both religions are trying to do the same thing. Christianity is trying to resolve the problem of evil. Buddhism is trying to resolve the problem of evil. It just doesn't call it evil. It calls it uh, suffering. Same thing. All right. It doesn't get into like, okay, well, rape is, rape is a type of evil and murder is a type of evil and, 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 and torture is a type of evil and disease is a type of evil. All it does is it lumps it all. It's all suffering. It's all just suffering. And so what are we going to do with suffering, right? Well, we got to find a solution to it. So that's what Buddha set out to do. So what Buddha decided to do in his, in his efforts to understand the nature of suffering is he broke it down as that, well, where is it coming from? Is it coming from some evil God, you know, some evil God like Zoroastrianism? Or as some creations equate to Satan, is it coming from? No, no. Buddha knew it came from man too. Just like the Christians, Christianity teaches the same thing comes from man. Evil comes from man. Does not really, oh, look, no, you, I know you've been taught that it comes from Satan. It does not come from Satan, okay? Um, evil comes from you. Satan exists, but his power comes from you. you. You give him the power to do anything. It's not God. It's not him. It's you. Right? Sin. Sin is his, his, his fuel. And he can't sin the way you can because his decision's over, but yours continues on. Every decision you make creates a new sin, okay? That becomes fuel, nightmare fuel, really, for evil, okay? But in Buddha, Buddhism, they have a, a similar character, an archetype called Mara, but 
for Buddha, what he, he was very practical. He didn't like talking in, unlike Jesus, he really didn't like talking in parables. He liked to talk in, in more practical ways. And so Buddha said, well, this suffering or evil, if you prefer that term, comes from attachment. Humans attach to things and those things are impermanent because we're stuck in a universe that is dying and you can't attach to anything because eventually you're going to lose it. And that loss is where the problem is. So you might say, well, what does that have to do with, with evil? And um, what does that have to do with like something like murder or torture? It's all attachment. What, 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 are you, what are you committing murder for? Because you're attached to some condition that need, requires you to get somebody out of the way or to hurt them because you're attached to vindication or you're attached to greed or you're attached to something. But regardless of where the attachment is, it's attachment that causes it. And so Buddhism teaches us how to cease the pattern of attachment. Thus, the very word nirvana means extinguishing. It doesn't mean heaven. It doesn't mean paradise. It means extinguishing. What are we extinguishing? Suffering. How do we do that? By eliminating attachment. Okay. In both religions, we are the problem. We create samsara. Buddha would say that there is no difference between samsara and nirvana. For those of you who don't know about Buddhism, nirvana is sort of the, the condition of being fully awake. And samsara is the condition of being stuck in the cycle of perpetual rebirth. And how does rebirth happen? This reincarnation stuff, it's attachment. Attachment to life, you can't let go. Can't let go, too afraid. Attachment to, attachment to comfort. Attachment to security and safety. Buddha taught, it all has to go. Jesus taught, it all has to go. Jesus gives us the cross as the archetype of this. Buddha gives us a fundamental awareness. They're both kind of the same thing, really. It's all about eliminating attachment, right? And then a realization happens at that point. It all comes from us, though. And we're stuck in what Buddha would have said is the Maya, the illusion. This comes from Hinduism because he was very much, I mean, Buddhism is really a continuation of Hinduism in the same way that Christianity is a continuation of Judaism. Almost exactly the same thing, okay? And Hinduism teaches that all of the world is an illusion. It's not really here. It doesn't mean that the energy is not real, but it means that our interpretation of it, our experience of it, our, our, our perception of it is completely a fabrication of the human mind. And it's all based on attachment to comfort and safety that keeps the illusion alive. And as long as we keep focusing on that, we're stuck. We will keep coming back here lifetime after lifetime after lifetime until we finally realize that it's not necessary and we learn how to transcend it. Once we transcend it, we break the illusion and guess what happens? We wake up. We wake up. You wake up from Sheol. You wake up from Hades. You resurrect from the dead. All of it. Even the physicality of it, which I do. I do believe in the physicality of the resurrection. I still know it's an illusion for our sake to in order to get there. We don't need it in the actual condition because the actual condition is we're already there. Just like Buddha said, you're not in samsara. You're in nirvana. It's just you're in samsara when you don't know you're in nirvana. And I'm going to tell you that you're in heaven right now, but you're stuck in the dying process forever in Sheol. Eventually that will be the end destination because you're sleeping. You're sleeping. So we don't have to worry about God watching all the evil because he's not watching all the evil. You're watching all the evil. You're playing it over and over again. That's your reincarnation. You're playing it over and over and over and over again and you can't get out of it. You're stuck in the cycle. That's samsara. Christian or Buddhist, does not matter. You're doing it. You're doing it right now. And you're not awake. That's why you can't, you can't shake it. Your fear has you. And you can't get out of it. You're stuck. 
And that's why you need God, the grace of God to wake you up. If you're Buddhist, well, you don't need God. Then you just do it yourself. It's a lot harder that way, though. That's why they say it takes, you know, three immeasurably eons sometimes. With God, all you need is just to say yes. I think that one's a better one, personally. But I think both ways get you there. I do. I just think one's harder than the other. So I'm Christian because I think it's a lot, it makes a lot more sense to me. Okay. But that's what's going on here, folks. So did God, so let's go back to the, through the paradox and we can take our break and come back and talk about it. Can God prevent evil? He already, he, he already did. He already did. He created a perfect universe and you screwed it up. And now he's given you a way to go back to the way it should have been. If you choose to wake up. If you choose to stay sleeping, well, then you're going to stay forever asleep. Does God know about all the evil? Of course he does. But he also knows that it's not really happening. It's happening for you. And he wants to get you out of that cycle of perpetual attachment. Do you want to get out of it? Here's your chance. Does God want to prevent evil? Of course. That's why he's waking you up. Then why is there evil? Because you are attached to it. You can't get out of it. You're, you're too stuck in your greed. You're too stuck in your selfishness. You can't break it. You need grace to do that. Could God have created a universe without these? He already did. Then why didn't he? Well, that's a, that's a, a moot point because we already know he did. And you're still free. You're free to wake up and you're free to stay sleeping. What's your choice? We'll be back after this.
Welcome back, everybody, to the third and final part. It's more than an hour now. The uh, vestiges after dark. Assuming we don't get um, blown away by the tornadoes, I still don't think. I don't know. I can't hear anything outside these headphones, so maybe it's you know maybe we're about to die. I don't know. Anyway, not a big deal because it's all illusion anyway, right? <laughs> When we come back here, uh, Father Chris, Brandon Milam, and Jamie Wolf will all be joining us to discuss. And I would love to hear from some of you. If you'd like to join the discussion, you can call into the show at 718-362-6380. That's 718-362-6380. Remember to enter pin number 855-4111. That's 855-4111 to be placed into the queue. We'll also take questions and comments and stories from chat. Um, our moderators are looking at them and collecting them, uh, and uh, we'll bring them on the air, too, if there's time. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot to talk about here, and we have more than an hour to do it, so it's going to be fantastic. Don't go away. You know, um, sometimes people um, also ask me about, you know, the nature of illusion and everything else and say, well, wait a second, I know my pain and suffering is real. I feel it and deal with it chronically every single day, and it's truly torturous. You're not going to tell me that that's an illusion. You know, I am going to tell you that because um, it only feels more real to you because you're having a divine dream, honestly. Um, it's a God-level dream because you're actually a divine creature made in his image. And, and, and the capacity to go into these types of delusionary states is that powerful that you can create the uh, fabrication of an authentic situation when you're actually just fading away in it um you know my wife had a, a dream the other night it was a really bizarre one too um i don't think she'd mind me saying what it was and she she, she was dreaming about uh, being um uh, she was slowly going blind. She was diagnosed with a with a disorder um, that it was very technical and everything else, and 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 that she had to prepare herself by going into to this this special center where they train you and how to deal with um, this this condition until eventually you lose all of your eyesight. And in the dream, she was slowly losing eyesight. Like as she went through this, she was feeling every single moment of it. And uh, I can tell you right now when she was in that dream i'm sure that that was just as real as anything else was because it was terrifying to her and then she woke up and she can see and that's what it's going to be like for all of you when you enter into the condition that we call in christianity salvation or if you're buddhist nirvana you're going to wake up and see things the way they really are in a way that you never thought you could and you'll realize the difference of the dream and all that pain and suffering that you went through it's not going to mean anything anymore it just isn't okay so um if you like i said if you got questions call into the show i'm going to go ahead and put that number on the screen for you and we'd like to hear from you but we'll take your questions in chat um but i know that the panel here probably has a lot to unpack from it so i'm not going to say who should go next you guys can decide that for yourselves and let's chat <laughs> i was just gonna i was just gonna immediately reflect on on you know what's real what's not uh, another good question to reveal the complexity of that is to say are your memories real mm-hmm yeah. You say, oh, well, yeah, you. they are, because I'm remembering something that happened in time and space. Like, yeah, but you're not really remembering it. No. You're not reliving it. 
right. you know, you are, you are, um, you have an illusion of what you, what you interpreted as having happened in the past. And that's not the same thing as knowing what happened in the past. Um, yeah. so even, even ideas of knowing it, but I made I made a few, um, I was making some notes as you were talking, and of course you address almost all of them. Okay. Um, which I thought, well, I thought you would. You know, I thought you, you've got to set out the problem, right? And yeah. Then, and then work through the solution. And yeah. so I was like, you know, yeah, but um, uh, one of them you did speak to, speak to in terms of uh, linear time, you know, because the, the, the a priori problem of the paradox is it, it's got its own paradox within it, <laughs> which is that it's asserting human limitations to God. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, cause like you said, I mean, and it's, it, it transcends not only time and space linear, you know, linear time, but also if you think about, um, Job in the old Testament, uh, um, Satan is, is there to test his love of God. God says, look, he loves me. So Satan says he only loves you because he's got everything, mm -hmm. you know, um, let me take it away from him. So he takes it away from him. And then at the end, God restores a family, uh, um, uh, a livelihood, cattle, all the rest of it. Because God can do that. Uh, God can raise the dead. Um, and so we, we, we're not, um, in a way, we're limiting God to human characteristics in this paradox when it suits us. Mm -hmm. uh, and then ignoring God's limitlessness uh, when it suits us. Uh, so the, the paradox itself is, is um, self-defeating it, it just from a purely philosophical point of view. I've not even mentioned Jesus, um, you know, uh, and, and so, but also, and I will shut up after this because I want to hear what Jamie and Brandon have got to say, but you, you know, I've said this on the show before, and, but I don't say this lightly. I'm not some mad ascetic who, who wears a hair shirt and a stillus every day. I, I'm very pain averse. You know, it saved my life when I was a policeman being pain averse. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I want to avoid that like, like most human beings that aren't insane. I want to avoid pain as much as possible. But I believe suffering is the meaning of life. Mm. And, and so uh, when people say to me, how can you believe in God because there's suffering? I say, no, I believe in God because there is suffering. Um, so I believe suffering is beneficial to the human race. Um, and, and as you said, God has created perfection. It's called heaven. He then created the perfect earth. It's called Eden. Um, and and as you said, because of free will, we, we have uh, chosen to grasp after being equal to God. Pride is the original sin, really, wanting to be like God. Um, and so... Uh, suffering becomes the remedy to suffering. That's what, you know, that's why God enters in. This is now a Christian claim. God enters into time and space and takes on suffering and conquers suffering through suffering, or, or as the Easter proclamation of the Orthodox says, conquering death through death. Um, uh, and so now there's a, I did, I actually prepared for this show, which I know shock horror. Um, and, and some of them are quotes and I'm not going to read them all, but there's one quote from CS Lewis in the problem of pain, um, which speaks to this. And he says, quote, try to exclude the possibility of suffering, which the order of nature and the existence of free wills involve. And you will find that you have excluded life itself. End quote. And so obviously it speaks to me because I, th I, I think that suffering is, is the meaning. Suffering is the means by which we encounter the meaning of life, which is, which is the antidote to suffering, which is God, which is not the absence of pain. It's, it's, um, it, another, another Aeschylus, another, another, uh, Greek, um, said nothing, nothing forces us to know what we do not want to know except pain, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so uh, these things interact. Pain and suffering are the, are the necessary preconditions that prepare our our um, our will to choose to encounter the suffering servant who is Christ. I think there's and there's that's all I'll say. there is truth to that because well, I mean, I'm going to simplify it down a lot more than it probably deserves. So because there's a lot to unpack there, but let's just keep it simple for a moment and say. What happens when you die in your dream? I've done it many, many times. You Thank wake, you. you wake up almost immediately. Um, usually in a jolt, like you jolt up awake. Um, 
you never really see anything after that. It's not like you're like, oh, I'm in heaven now. I, I did. It did have a dream where it's like, you know, I was chopped in half by an elevator, and I remember looking up and being like, oh, that was interesting. But then I just woke right up. Um, and let, let's say you know you're you're fast asleep and you can't wake a person up. I, I guarantee you, if you you smack them across the face or you you, you put a lighter under ne- their nose or something, you're going to jolt them away. Pain is awakening. Pain is what it is truly to be alive because the pain is the is the absolute stimulus and the difference between why it hurts a human being and cannot hurt a di- immortal in, in being like a god or let's just say a resurrected body that has achieved salvation uh, is because pain is what reality actually is it's the, it's pure stimuli that's all you're feeling what is what is pain it is just the brain overreacting to stimuli in a way that your body can't handle it but it's actually what it means to be alive Father Chris is actually 100% on target there. Not quite the theological reason he was saying it. I'm, I'm going to, you know, I, I know there's more mm-hmm. theological no, stuff but you're, there. But you're right. I but, mean, you know, if, if, my, if my only reason I don't believe in God is because I've got a chronic pain in my foot, mm-hmm. well, you could sever my spinal cord and I wouldn't feel that pain anymore. But you'd be start to become it's just, numb. It's just an electrical signal. Signal, but well, well, you know, I'm not sure that that's a very good. Um, well, what happens uh, when you uh, when you drug someone? Like you know, like what they do. Like yeah. why I left. Why I left psychology? Because um, what was happening is they weren't treating these patients that had bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, um, you know, any number of other things, schizoaffective disorder. I mean, name one. Okay, they weren't treating them. They weren't curing them. There is no way to treat or cure them. The only way that they could uh, deal with it is to numb them so they they pump them full of haldol or some other drug and makes them easier for the rest of us to deal with they spend almost all their time sleeping or in like a comatose state or a, a, a you know they're just like zombies walking around and that's what happens when you deal pain you be you you you, you start to no longer exist so yeah pain is basically the reason it hurts the question is pain's not the problem why does pain hurt is the problem and the reason pain hurts is because you've identified too closely to your humanity. If you were in connected to, to perfectly to God, if you were a perfect being again, assuming you achieved it, then pain is, is, is the wonderful reality of being alive. You just can't handle it, which is why you want to die. And that's why, you're, you're, that's why your well, reality but, but, is pushing also, you towards death. But also, um, uh, suffering in terms of you know, physical ailments is, is one thing, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but we also suffer morally. Mm-hmm. And now that's unique. That's unique to humans that in very. this world that we, you know, um, but again, I mean, Tolstoy said, so he said, how can one be well if one suffers morally? Um, Dostoevsky, the other Russian said, I want to suffer so that I may love. And, and the, you see those things interact, right? They you do. Know, we suffer morally so that we can, we can enter into a deeper understanding of what, of what love means. And, and that's why, you know, for Christians, it, 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 we can't separate this from the cross because that's the ultimate sign of God's love. Um, and so, you know, if you've ever been suffering. in love with another person, if you've like truly like <laughs> fallen so far in love with someone, if you have had the blessing of that experience and when you're in it, it almost hurts. It almost it's does feel like pain. Well. Yeah. Because you're afraid of losing it. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, that's the attachment aspect yeah. of it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, Jamie. Um, what are your thoughts? You broke up there. Are you asking me? Uh, yeah. I said, what, what are your thoughts? So uh, I agree with, with Father Chris, and we, we're very similar. Um, I don't have a C.S. Lewis quote, but uh, <laughs> I, I have a few musical quotes. But what, I don't either, so out, don't worry about it. <laughs> one thing that stuck out is, you know, how do you know – you don't know how good you want to be until you have seen real evil and you can't, you can't improve upon yourself without having tasting that. Um, you can't grow without pain. I know that I, I, my accident probably shook me awake because I experienced more pain than I ever felt, but I also experienced more 
divinity than I've ever felt mm-hmm. at the same time. Because the pain is so, a divinity. Your the body pain, just can't handle that. it. It's, as we say in the military, pain is just weakness leaving the body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whether it's physical, spiritual, or whatever. It's true. Um, but I, I believe that, that we can't, we can't grow. We can't learn. We can't realize how wonderful love is and how important it is without seeing the dark side too. And so that's why evil is allowed to exist. And in, in my opinion, in, in our linear, linear concept, um, and go, going, going, yeah, uh, I, I, I can ask you a question, Jamie. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I've been, I've been around, I, I think I've only ever been around one person who I thought, Oh my, you're the closest thing to evil I've ever met. You know, and um, and it was it, it it was um there was a metaphysical nature to it. It wasn't just what he'd done, which was all it was horrendous, but there was something about the person. I thought, gosh, you, you know, I think you are actually the closest thing to evil I've ever seen. But my response to that wasn't to feel better about how, how who I was. Like it's not like oh you're more evil than me, so I'm off the hook. Right. My response to that was to say, oh my god, I've really got to guard myself. Yes. against becoming consumed by evil. I, Absolutely. I, I don't know. What's your response? Absolutely, because we all we all have we all have the ability to do it, and it's a slippery slope. It's one one bad decision can lead you down that that trail. But if you can see the end the end result, if you can see true evil at the end of it, you you'll be able to reel yourself back in and realize, you know what? I don't I don't want to go that way. I've seen what mm-hmm. what's waiting for me. I've seen the horrendous behavior of man. I mean, I've seen the horrible things men have done. And there's just no way I could ever do that unless it was because yeah, people, people confuse know. people confuse weakness with goodness. Right. You know, I mean, uh, you know, goodness is actually to to uh, know that you are empowered to do terrible things that yes, you could I actually would do, do terrible them things and not and choose not to. Yeah. And, you know, right. and choose not to. You know, so we're all monsters. It's just how we how we keep yeah. that monster in check. Well, that's the difference but, between good and good people and bad people. I mean, I, I I've said yeah. it. I said it during Holy Week. I'll, I'll say it again here. If anyone right. didn't tune into the services, we all contain the same fullness of evil, the entirety of evil. We all contain the entirety of it, not just a little bit. You can't say that person's more evil than this one. No, we're all that evil. The only time that the only thing that separates. It so that somebody might say, oh, that person's a saint or this person's like the devil himself is how much control the person has over that extreme evil. If you have a lot of control, then you're going to be looked at as a good person. If you don't have a lot of control, you're going to be looked at as a bad person. But that doesn't change the fact that you contain the fullness of evil right now. So never judge anyone's evil because you've got it, too. What you can judge is what they control, how well they control right. it, because all of us should be working to do better with it. Doesn't mean that everyone's going to be have full mastery over it. We're all at different stages of development, um, and as long as you're doing a little better each time, then you're making progress. That's that's all God ever would expect from you. Okay, that's all He expects from you. Yeah, I, 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 and, and being pathetic and impotent is not goodness, right? You know, you think, oh, I don't harm anybody. Do yeah. you do anyone any good? Right. You know, like, have you done anything for somebody else yeah, right, or are you right. just useless? Right. If you're just useless, you're not good. <laughs> you, That's right. You're just useless. It's true. No, apathy is the worst of one of the worst evils, in my opinion. Brandon, what are your thoughts on all this? Yeah. I, I had read something uh, a couple of days ago, and I think it goes back to what Father Chris was saying, where a person is peaceful only when they have the potential to do harm, but choose not to. If you don't have the potential, you're, um, uh, what was the word? Uh, I just had it. Insignificant. Impotent. I'll go with that. That wasn't the word I'll go with. Impotent. So you're, you're, only, you're only peaceful if you have the ability to choose violence, but you choose not to. But I will say with the paradox, I, I didn't know looking into it, I wanted to go in like as fresh as I could because one of the things – if God is all powerful, then how does evil exist? That one question has been around my entire life. Essentially, I always hear a person ask, well, what about this? And the churches that I went to at the time had an answer for it, which you have shown that that is not the answer. The church's answer was, oh, it's Satan. Satan is responsible for everything evil. 
nothing or if if it's not of God, everything not of God is of Satan. Which and is so to make for sense years, in a God. It is. That's Zoroastrianism. Thank, thank that's you. not Christianity anymore. That's Zoroastrianism, literally. Thank you. Can you say that one more time? <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's fascinating to see that how you explain this paradox that Buddhism or just two religions, two ideologies can can. can Wow, English is really hard for me today. Words are it's all to me. related. I got it's what you're saying. Related. And I think that's what I was trying to related. That's what I was trying to say, Brandon, yeah. when I say and I've said it so many times before, Harmonize. and I think Harmonize. Yeah, that's uh, that good. Yeah. Um I think when people hear me say that my Christianity did ha- had no meaning until I became a Buddhist and then found my way back, this is what I this is why I say that. Because I needed to be able to understand the scope and the magnitude of those mysteries that Buddhism handles so well and Christianity handles so poorly. Likewise, the same is true for certain things in Christianity that Buddhism handles very poorly. Um, It's, it's, it's uh, apathy towards God is, is, um, is problematic. I mean, it really is. Uh, And, you know, I mean, again, they're not they're not atheists, but they um, they and, and there is a certain divinity to Buddha nature and that kind of thing. But it's not a relationship. You know, what we have in Christianity is, is, is an intimacy with God, an intimate relationship with God. And it's not a God. It's not like having an intimacy with a God. It's not like, you know, coming into the favor of Zeus or something. <laughs> it's 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 being it's with a person. Y- y- yes. Yes. And it's, and it's all encompassing. You're talking about a pervasive experience, a pervasive intimacy um, with all that is uh, so far and beyond one simple thing, like, like Zeus or one simple thing, like one God, um, you know, God is actually, I, 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 you know, father, tell me what you think about this, but I was talking this Holy week with Tracy and Jamie. And I said, you know, one of the worst misnomers that I think we use in the church today is that we call churches churches. We should call churches churches. We should call them temples or sanctuaries. Uh, yeah, but I agree with that. But the church is us. Is the church is the people, the body of Christ right. that is not a building. And uh, I think it's become in the vernacular. Just when you hear the word church, you think of you know the place that you go. No, it's the place yeah, the, the that you're author, at. The Orthodox do call them temp- the Orthodox do call them temples. And they should. Actually. They should. Um, in in their liturgy, they use the word temple. temple. And, you know, yeah. I mean, I mean, whether we because often they're in the English speaking world, they'll they'll say church because you know. Well, they've they always the been English very vernacular. World. But the the point yeah. I'm making with this is that the same can be true for I think honestly, it's really a shame that we call God God too, because it just sounds like, even though we use the capital G. It still sounds like he's just another God out there. He's not another God out there. And that's why I think Hinduism does a better job than both, than both here, because uh, Hinduism has a term for this. It doesn't, you know, there's all the gods of, of Hinduism, but there's Brahman and, you know, and Brahman is the all encompassing, not a God, really the entirety of all gods well, and all people. We, we, yeah. We do have a word we could use for that, but we don't use it out of respect for our Jewish brothers and sisters. Um, bec- you know, yeah. we could say Yahweh, right? right. You know, but um, we don't do that on purpose. Well, we could say I, I, I am, mean, <laughs> but that would that would yeah, still sound true. awkward, that's though. True. It would sound awkward. Or, Ad- or Adonai, we could say. Mm-hmm. Um, but, the, 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 you know, there's um, often, well, when I've been at Orthodox churches, when they preach, they never shorten the name of Jesus, they always say our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ, yeah. because, uh, you know, now that's, that's a mouthful, no, it is, <laughs> but, no. but, uh, but I know why they do that for that very reason, because they're not talking about an amorphous God, right. you know, a generic God. They're talking about the God. The God. Now, the, the other thing I wanted to have your reflection on, especially, you know, Brandon and uh, Brandon really, but um, you've all been exposed to it is I came to Christianity through the Baptist church. So I understand Protestantism pretty well. Um, And they talk about having a personal relationship with Jesus. Now, for me, and this might be because I'm so English, 
it, for me, that was always a really um, alienating concept for me because I thought, what on earth do you mean by that? Do you mean, you know, he phones you up? He sends you emails. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, and, and I actually think it's I actually think it's really unhelpful language to use. Mm, it is. But actually, we are we are describing in this in this whole episode what that really means. You mm. know. So it, it, do you know what? It was after I was ordained a priest that I really kind of reconcile what it, what I what I think it really means, which is about um, acknowledging the name from which um, your salvation. That all that's been revealed to us is through, mm-hmm. and and that the relationship is one of saying it is about what's my daily response to that revelation. Mm-hmm. I think you know, but I don't know. I mean, because for me, it just feels like such a. It's like oh, I've got I, I've got a personal relationship with Jesus. Have you? You know, like it feels like a kind of elitist way of thinking, and I, th- I think a dangerous. Well, it way is, of yeah. particularly in, in Southern Baptists. I, I mean, you know, I've I've found that my experience with Southern Baptists is very elitist. But I would say American Christianity is a very elitist thing. Period. Even in the Catholic and Orthodox churches, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it's 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 bad here. It's very um, it's very sectarian um, in its approach towards the gospel. Uh, everyone's vying to say that they're the ones that have it right. So, yeah. you know, it's, I think it's different in, 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 in other countries. I, I, I think the, denom- the denominations themselves operate differently in other countries than they do here. Um, so, although I would say what I you think, I think I think it's also that, that you know, the, the default position in Australia, Britain, New Zealand, mm-hmm. most of Europe, the default position of people in, in society is that, you don't believe in God at all. Like that's the default. <laughs> it's a default. Yeah, and that's so, so baseline. You don't need to prove anything. Yeah. 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 And you don't have to have any responsibility either. <laughs> well, I, right. uh, for me, that's why most people want to be atheists mm-hmm. because the, alter- the alternative comes with some obligations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's just not desirable, right? It's, it's, all, about, it's all about pleasure, not pain. <laughs> like you said, mm-hmm. it's a, it pains the problem, right? We shun it. And we actually should embrace it because it is life. It is truly life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what, Cause what happens when you're dead, when you're dead, you don't feel anything at all anymore. Right. You, you don't feel so. And that's, that's what you, so pain is truly life. And it's just the reason your bodies can't handle it is because you can't handle reality. You're afraid of reality. It's just a reminder that you're still in the fight. Mm-hmm. Mm. It is. Yeah. And, and well, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great line in Brideshead Revisited. Have you read that? Evelyn War? Is that? Uh, it's very English. I'm not. I'm not. I'm sure not, I, I'm not fa- no, I'm not. I'm not familiar with it. But th- th- there was a brilliant um, TV adaptation of it with Jeremy Irons. Um, oh, I love Jeremy Irons. Oh, I love that guy. Yeah, but yeah, you know, Jerry. Yeah. So, uh, so well, you should watch it. I mean, uh, you know, Brighton revisited. It's amazing. Watch him. Watch of- him in Margin Call. He is so. I actually, I, 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 I knew him once. Did uh, you? Because he, yeah, he lived on my patch when I was a policeman. Oh wow, that's fantastic! No, he's a brilliant yeah. actor. He really is. Um, watch him in, in Margin Call. If you haven't seen Margin Call, that's definitely one. In my opinion, that's my favorite role he's in. Um, but he also was great well, as Scar the, the too. Play, <laughs> yeah, he was. The, 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 the character, he, oh, he, and he was in um, uh, Die Hard too as well, wasn't he? Uh, but the, the, the character he plays in um, in uh, Brideshead um, is this sort of, you know poor upper classes kind of guy. So he's kind of depend. He goes to Oxford and he's dependent on the goodwill of other people. And he hangs around with, you know, Lords and all the rest of it. Mm. But one of the reflections he makes is, um, he's, he says, uh, no one is ever holy without suffering because mm. there's this undercurrent of, of, um, Catholicism. Cause he's with this aristocrat. that's a Catholic, which is unusual in England, especially in that period. So the, you know, and there's, and and, and the, the uh, read it, read it. You know, mm. and or watch the the TV adaptation. But the it's very much a kind of um, an odyssey of how how holiness comes through suffering. I will. I'll look into you it. Know. So, do we have questions from the audience? I don't want to neglect anybody. Anything that came in over the last uh, two and a half hours, Brandon, uh, Father Chris, Jamie. Yes. Uh, on Facebook, we have a couple questions. Okay. Let's see right here. If, if they can pull up correctly. I'll be right back once I find it. All right. No worries. 
Um, if anybody has one, uh, you can go into the chats all, all across the internet. We're 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 simulcasting on on Facebook at Exorcist Bishop, uh, Instagram at Exorcist Bishop. We're on YouTube at uh, at Nickelayan. Um, we're also on Spreaker audio only that will eventually turn into the podcast that gets sent out to all the podcast uh, um, services uh, that uh, iHeartRadio, um, you know, iTunes, all that stuff. Um, we're on uh, Jamie's uh, Twitter account uh, and uh, we're, we're everywhere. So ask a question and it should come up on our screens and we'd be more than happy to answer anything. There, there was a co- there was a comment by Brandon, actually, which is, um, you know, which again was the reflection on, uh, many of the synchronicities between uh, world religions, in this case, you know, Buddhism and Christianity, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, versus the sort of we're right and everyone else is wrong mentality. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and that might be something worth speaking to. Um, I, I, w- I will say in, in that regard, I do remember because I was born, I was raised Southern Baptist. I do remember even being told that say the Methodists, got it wrong that we're right or like the church of christ they're wrong we're right we're all in the same religion but no they're right or they're wrong we're right well i, I always think that always reminds me of monty python you know in the life of brian you know the Ju- judean people's front or the free free people's front of judea you know the, the, all these kind of um arguments over over who's pure enough or whose whose cause is righteous enough or what have you but i think i I mean i just want i just want it's worth reflecting on how many gods do they think there are right you see i i have i have a very very um uh um what's the word um conservative understanding (laughs) of the christian god and that conservative understanding says that jesus christ is not competing with other gods that there is only one God, mm-hmm. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, and the, therefore all other, uh, sorry, every human being who has ever lived, who has ever um, been formed, uh, has been responding to the same God, regardless of their culture. I agree with that completely. From, the catechism, uh, the, the catechism of the Catholic God. Church specifies that very clearly, I think. Absolutely. Man's pursuit of God, which of course we know in Christianity is God's pursuit of man, but um, yes. man's pursuit of God in the catechism comes first. And so Carl uh, Rana, if you want to read more on that, Carl Rana had, it was, a, was a major theologian that influenced that development in the second Vatican council. Um, but, it, but what he says, you know, whatever conclusions he may come to that people might want to differ on the fundamental statement that there is only one God is, is something that no Christian can disagree with. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and I would, uh, uh, as you've alluded to, no Hindu could either, despite the fact they it's took true. gods. No, I mean, the, the, that's uh, the thing it, about Hinduism is it's really not polytheistic. It's actually no. a, a a very radical form of monotheism, but you have to understand yeah. it in order to know that, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we, we, we would describe it in Christian terms as mod- as a form of modalism, really. Yeah. Um, you know, but but um, the, the the fundamental truth is that there is only God. And therefore, people are seeking to respond to God or seeking to um, to run away from God. They're the only two options: to serve God or run away from Him. And we all do both, by the way. Um, oh, yeah. And so, and so, uh, that's why it shouldn't surprise us that you know, even materialist atheist thinkers say things. You go, no, we agree with that. You know, we agree with that part because because um, there's only one God. God is truth. Uh, and people respond to that truth, even, no matter how corrupted they may be or how or how wrong we think their overall theology may be. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that's why I get so annoyed with Christians who, um, and I do it too. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not playing um, innocent on this, but who really try to pull each other apart in order to just feel superior. Well, like, I think what it comes back to. Okay, well, this is a very. I think useful means of discernment in terms of trying to de- decide, you know, when is the the divisions within a particular religion or worldview, um, you know, when has it gone too far? Like, at what point is it no longer what it started out as? Um, and when you really look at um, 
the various schisms and heresies that that came into play over you know the last uh, several millennia uh, it really it's always the same story that causes it it's basically uh, one person <laughs> or a group led by one person says that Somewhere along the line, everyone before them got it wrong, but they're the ones that somehow got it right, and they're going to go forward with it, going it right. Islam's based on this. Islam's based, their enti- the entire foundation of Islam is based on saying that the Jews and Christians got it wrong, but we got it right, so we're going to fix it. Um, Protestantism is based on that. The Orthodox and Catholics got it wrong, so we're going to fix it with Reformation. And everyone thinks that reformation is a good thing. Reformation is not a good thing if all parties aren't participant. This is why the great schism happened. You're being too kind. You're being too kind. Most Protestants have never even heard of orthodoxy. I know that's true, you know, the, but the I originally don't even know what they're objecting uh, to. I, I know that's true, but originally, you know, I can say that. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, though, that even the great schism between orthodoxy and Catholicism mm-hmm. was because there was disunity in the decision, the deciding factors mm-hmm. going forward. It doesn't mean that we stay complacent and say that the church doesn't evolve, religion doesn't evolve, our you know, revelation continues. I, I'm very much against this, not, this idea that re- revelation just suddenly stopped uh, with the apostles, and now we're just like fixed in that, you know, this ancient viewpoint. I, I think the Holy Spirit yeah, still that, keeps talking mostly- to us. That's a Muslim viewpoint, not a Christian viewpoint. It, 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 but, you're uh, right. That's one of the problems with Islam is that they, they say this is the final fixed, word. That's it. But the pro- Christianity doesn't do that. But it, but it kind of does, though, because it, it does not, I mean, it does not move forward because it's too afraid to change the past. And so it, it we, does. We, we also believe Christ will come again, and that's why it's not the final word. Correct, and that helps us. It does, and and not that there's not changes, but every time there's, every time there's there, there's a a, a a move towards a different direction, people get upset, and so it creates problems. Mm-hmm. It creates disharmony. I mean, look at Vatican II. That's a perfect example of of the disharmony mm-hmm. that it can cause, even when the church is operating as a whole. Um, but the reality of it is, though, and, and it didn't really cause schisms, although now it might be. But the the the, the reality of it is that um, I think in discernment, we have to look at the foundations. And then decide if there were changes, did the church operate as a whole or as an isolated point? If, if the answer to, to it is an isolated point, then I, I would be suspicious of that direction. Okay. If the answer to it is that, um, uh, that, that, you know, like, let me give you some examples. Okay. We have the Neocene Creed. Um, most Christians can read the Neocene Creed and say, I agree with everything that it says because that's the foundations of the faith. But guess what? And I'm not, I'm not saying this to criticize people. Understand that. But I am saying that we have to be very careful with our semantics here. Okay. So it might be offensive to some, and I'm sorry for that, but it's the truth. Okay. Um, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons are not Christians because they cannot look at the Neocene Creed and say, I agree with everything that's in that. So here's a point where there was a deviation under one leader in the in the in the terms of uh, Mormon is Joseph Smith, right? Um, and so then there's a branch off, and like we got it right, all right. So this is the next step, but it's like you didn't do it with the church. You only did it with your little subgroup, which is an egotistical point of view. And they said, well, but Bishop, you did that. You're, you, you're, you're the head of the Nicolaitan Catholic Church. We're not, we're not divisive like that at all. We follow the, the, the catechism and the magisterium. We have our interpretations on certain points that are philosophical interpretations only. We do not change dogma or doctrine. Actually, we don't have much use for dogma, but we don't change doctrine, Okay. It, at the most, what we'll say is that we will leave certain things to an individual's conscience, which is a very Catholic thing to say, very Roman Catholic thing to say, okay? Um, but we do not change anything. This is why they're like, I, I mean, I found um, somebody brought to my attention. I didn't find it. Somebody brought to my attention a lot of nasty things being said about this church and me and Jamie <laughs> on, on Reddit, okay? Um, which is the cesspool, the shithole of the internet. 
And um, it's basically where everyone goes to shit. Actually, it's where everyone goes to have diarrhea, okay? Because it looks more like diarrhea than it is. Yeah, yeah, it is. And so um, what ends up happening there, and what they're talking about there is they're they're talking about how this is a fake church and I'm a fake bishop and, you know, everything else. Um, But the reality of it is when 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 you look at these types of claims and everything else, they don't understand what I've done. So we've got people that are saying, oh, it's a great church because, um, you know, they're, they're, they're accepting of, of trans people. They give blessings and everything, but no, wait a second. They're not that good. I looked at their FAQ and they don't, they don't marry gay people. So they, they hate gays. Um, so we love the trans, but we hate the gays. Apparently they're saying, I mean, this is, I'm not kidding you. This is the threads there. And it's like, no, we don't hate anybody. Okay. But I'm not going to change it on my own for you. All right. Now, if we want to go all gather as an ecumenical council with all the bishops and all the leaders of all the churches and come together and say, we're going to do this or we're not going to do this. That's something different, okay? But I am not going to say, I'm going to take the Nicolaian church and say, let's start marrying gay people. Would I like to do well, that? And, and, that, and that's why the, the, the fundamental difference is that Mormons and um, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, it's not like we need to have an ecumenical council to explore their Christology, which is why, why they are heretics. Uh, the fact is that the, the ecumenical councils have rejected their Christology in the fourth and fifth centuries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, it's not as though we need to, yeah, oh, oh, they've got a new idea. Let's have a look at it. No, no. They're following an old idea that's already been rejected. Um, in the case of the Arians, the idea that, 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 that God, the son was created in the womb of, of, of Mary and therefore is kind of, kind of Apollo type, half God, half man. Yeah. Um, the church has already rejected that. And so we don't need to examine that any further. Well, I that hate was done at a true ecumenical council. And I hate when people say, you know, Oh, there's the, the, the there's the books and the, and the, and the Catholics threw them out of the Bible because they didn't want, you know, they didn't like it. It, it, it reduced their control. All these silly accusations and they don't even understand what they're what they're even talking about you know the 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 reason that gnosticism as a as a as a christianity or ebionites or 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 marcionites or all the different christianities that were out there the reason that these things were rejected you know as heresies um is because they were deviations and the church came together and said, that is not our faith, but they did it as one whole. They didn't go off on their own and say, oh, we're the Roman Catholics, so we're going to do it our way now. They, well, the Church of Rome did kind of do that, you know, with the, the, the phililoquy. And that's what, that was yeah, part yeah. Of, the, of the Great Schism. It was. Um, in fact, if you ask an Orthodox and say, well, why did you, you know, why did you break up with the, with, with the church, you know, with the, with the Roman Catholic Church? They said, well, no, they broke from us. Um, and the Orthodox, and the Roman Catholic Church would say, no, we never broke from you. That's true. <laughs> we never broke from you. And Roman Catholics really don't really have a problem with, with Orthodox coming in to receive communion. But uh, God forbid a Roman Catholic tries to do that. <laughs> <laughs> they'll rebaptize yeah, you yeah. if a Roman Catholic, yeah, Catholic wants to come in. They'll rebaptize you. I mean, it's it's um, uh, official Roman Catholic teaching is is the Orthodox are part of the Church and therefore yeah. welcome to receive communion. Absolutely, the but the but the Orthodox tell their people you can't do not do that. It will se- <laughs> it will it be like a mortal. I mean, their version of a mortal sin. They don't have mortal sin, but they'll it'll be their version of it. You know. Um, so yeah, I mean, all right. Uh, any okay? Do we have any questions? Or I don't want to ignore the audience because there's nobody calling in. Uh, but there's a lot of, I mean, we got, a, we got 191 viewers right now. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah. We were at two, over, a little over 200 earlier, so we're doing pretty good tonight. Um, does, I don't want to ignore anyone. So does anyone have any questions? You can call in or you can ask it in the various chats. Did you guys so see anything? I did, find, okay. I did find a question from Facebook, and it goes back to the uh, paradox we're talking about. Uh, the question comes from Donna. Uh, if we have free will and a choice, and we are forgiven if we pass away, and Father Bishop has said that no one should be allowed to get away with child abuse or anything horrible in life. So my question is, if this does happen, at what point does the kind of evil have to pay? 
Well, the evil is the, is paid for in the answer to this. The the, the, the evil is paid for in the death of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's how it's paid. You can't pay it, and nobody, even the person themselves, can't pay it. See, you're not wanting forgiveness here. You want vindication, and vindication is not how God thinks. The judgment of God is not about vindication. It's not about revenge. It's about forgiveness and correction. You know, that's the difference. He's more like a dad than he is like a judge, okay? He's, we call him right. a judge, but he's more like a dad. You know, he will, he'll let you suffer your consequences, but he, you know, he, he's there with you, you know, and he'll help you get out of it. And that's kind of the kind of, you know, judgment that we have with God. It's not, the, it's not like issuing a sentence and saying, you are condemned. Um, and, and remember, there is no sin that is, that is so far and beyond that, you know, God can't handle it, you know, and that's what's important. And that's the difference. Okay. So but, we, but, but that's the hardest teaching. I mean, is. that's why I said there's a very hard answer it, to it, this. It is. And the hard answer to it is, it is that God can forgive things that we would not be able to forgive. Correct. And, and right. he doesn't expect now, you to be able to do it. Actually, you know, he wants you to forgive, but you know, he knows you're not going to be able to forget. He can forgive and forget because he doesn't just forgive the sin. He blots it out as though it never was. We're getting back into that annihilation thing. See, annihilation is more about not, more than just not about you not existing. It's about that in the condition that God exists, which is outside of time where everything's already rectified, it's already done, okay? The fullness of everything has already come to pass for God, all right? For us, we're still, we're, we're working it out. We're trying to catch up. God's way ahead of us and we're trying to catch up. We're following him there. But the fact of the matter is, okay, that in God's reality, it's all gone. It, these sins are not happening anymore. It's over, okay? He's blotted them out. They never happen. And that's what happens when, with the lake of fire and the second death. And that's what Revelation is actually talking about there, with the new heaven and the new earth. Where are these sins going? If he's blotting them out and removing them as though they never happened, being erased literally from time because they're being removed from existence. Okay. Um, I, I do think that that is a bar for a lot of people. Like they'll, they'll go so far with Christianity, but the point they can't get beyond is that, um, God can God loves somebody who you find reprehensible, like right. Yeah, that, that's that's a really really difficult uh, barrier to overcome. Well, it's it's uh, the it's only usually way when... to overcome it is to say, but I'm also you know like I, I might not be a child abuser, but actually every time I I uh, fail to live up to what God has created me to do, I I I'm equally in need of forgiveness. Like it, that's a really hard teaching. It's the truth. But it's very, I understand why people find that too difficult. Well, we're just, we're just, we're, we're, we're not at that level. We're linear. We're linear. So again, what's, what's, a, what, what more linear of there is there of a problem than to say that somebody must pay because something happened in the past. You're angry about it in the present and you want to see vindication in the future. That's a linear person problem. God does not think like that. He's not part of the linear problem. You are. And that's why we, we can't get beyond it where he can, because he's already existing where these sins are gone. They never happened in God's reality the one that we become a part of when we enter into salvation. These sins never happened. It wasn't just that you're uh, forgiven. And, and, and in those in those Kairos moments, you know, two measures of town, Kronos is the linear, Kairos is the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, um, in, those, in those Kairos moments we have, we're also in heaven with God. That's why, that's why they feel so profound. Yes. And, you know, Jamie said something earlier on, which is, which is really, it might be the most important thing that's been said on the show. Okay. Which she said, you know, in that, in that absolute pain after following her, I wouldn't say accident because it wasn't an accident following a drunk driver, wiping her out. Oh, following that um, drunk asshole that hit me. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, Cause that's not an accident. Right. Um, and so uh, he consented to the preconditions to making that thing ha happen or that being right. a risk. So, um, but it, you know, in that absolute pain and anguish, that's where the encounter with divinity occurred and, and, and you know that, that that's a kind of a, a profound example of what St. Paul says you know that where sin abounds grace abounds all the more and and, and that really that's really it like, like that's what we're dancing around the edges of here to say e even the most degraded sinner in this life um all that does is 
lead to an outpouring of God's grace. All right. You so know, calling and, and, in, we got a call here from the 330 area code in Ohio. Hello, you are on the air. Hi there, everybody. Hello. Hey. Welcome hey. to the show tonight. Thank you. Love every single one of y'all. We're you. learning a lot. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, question. Yeah. I'm going back to the second half. Uh, what do you have to say about the Mandela effect? Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, I think we talked a little bit about that a f uh, several, well, maybe a season or two ago. Um, we could probably it, have a show on we it. We could have a show on it. And I've do dealt with it a lot in the class, too. Um, yeah. I think there's a few factors going on here. Okay, there's a few factors going on with it. I think a large amount of it is that human memory, as Father Chris was talking about before, is not as good as we think it is. Um, it's actually quite terrible. And so... There is a phenomenon that happens that um, people can start to remember things the same way if they if a an error gets put out into mass consciousness and it's not caught. So, like the Bernstein Bears uh, Mandela effect one, I think is a perfect example as, of this, where it was just in your mind you see it as you think you know, Bernstein instead of Bernstein, right? Um, you see it as what you more commonly would, would notice. Um, there's the other one with the, um, with Snow White, you know, mirror, mirror on the wall. Um, when she doesn't say that, she says magic mirror on the wall, but people remember mirror, mirror on the wall. But yeah, you know, mirror. there's two, there's two explanations for that one that doesn't ever get well, talked about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, one of the explanations with, with, with the Snow White one is that there is a book in the UK, a children's book that was put out around the world. It wasn't just in the UK, but it was published in the UK, uh, which was a variation on Snow White. It, was, it wasn't a Disney produced one, I don't think. Or if it was, it was a different retelling. And in that book, it says uh, Mirror, Mirror on the Wall. And also for the Americans who were obsessed, you know, in the, in the, in the 80s, if you grew up in the 80s, you watched the Brady Bunch all the time because it was always on uh, on the kids' channel, right? Um, and on UHF back in the days when we had frequency oh, television. Yeah. Um, Brady Bunch was always on, and they did a Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs skit on one episode. And in that episode, they said, mirror, mirror on the wall. And because the Brady Bunch, whether you liked it or not, was so prolific that it got into mass consciousness, I think people start to remember the variations of it more than they do the original movie that it's based on with Snow White. And so then it changes in consciousness and then people are shocked when they see it. Now, the one that really gets me with the Mandela effect is the, uh, the um, uh, Stouffer's Stovetop Stuffing. It isn't a Stouffer's product, it's craft. And I swear to God, I remember when I was a kid, um, the commercials of Stouffer stovetop stuffing and even my parents buying it. Um, and, uh, it's never, it's never been, uh, Stouffer's. It was always craft. Um, and that was the shocking one for me. Where did that come from? Who knows? I don't know. So, I think well, that you, you've just shocked me because I've never heard of magic mirror on the wall because I am English and my book said mirror mirror on the wall. See that it's an English Mine thing. Too, it's it. an English thing. But in the Disney movie, she says magic mirror on the wall in the Disney right. movie. But in the books and I think the storytellings in Europe, it was mirror mirror. And I think that got out there. So it gets passed around and then people remember the way they hear it the most often, even if it's wrong or not original. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just not original, right? Not original to the story. So when they play the Disney movie one, she says magic mirror and people are like, what? She didn't ever used to say that. The one that, another one that really gets me is James Bond, um, Moonraker. There is this scene with the character Jaws um, where he falls in love with this um, pigtail girl that's, kind of yeah you know, kind of weird and um Braces, yeah. yeah and and yeah. because he's got the, the the metal mouth right um there's a scene that everyone remembers where he smiles at her because he's in love now and everything's going to be okay he's not going to try to kill james anymore um he, he smiles at her and she smiles back and every everyone remembers that she has braces because it's a yeah. parallel she does not go back and watch it she does not have braces she has perfect teeth no braces. I just said she had braces. Yeah, she doesn't. She doesn't. <laughs> uh, Everyone remembers the braces. So is that just a matter of that you remember Jaws, so you think that it's the braces? 
Uh, but see, I remember it being like, that's the, that's the contrast that they both smile at each other. They both have metal mouths. That's how I remember yes. it, but it's not well, how, yeah. how it's remembered. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Caller. No, no, I'm just agreeing with you. That's how I remembered it. Yeah. Yeah. So is there something weird going on? Um, possibly, but I think a lot of it has to do with human memory and how bad it is and how influenced it is and i think we're a lot more influenced by each other than we'd like to admit so i think that that well, I, probably it, explains a lot also, of it it's also it's also why we should be very very cautious about criminal investigations into people based oh. on not only memory but recovered memory like, yes i mean woof yes. if there's any room for flipping doubt that would be it as far as i'm concerned that's a, a very dangerous thing to do well, that's why i don't like hypnosis and all that that hypnotic yeah. uh memory recall and all that stuff i don't like right. it because i don't think it's reliable i think the brain can implant i think you can clearly implant a false memory um absolutely i mean i have one i remember growing up with one and saying to my parents you know this this and this happened and then brian, like brian that never happened and i swear for years even to this day i still have a memory of this event and nobody has been able to say validate that it happened they all like no that never happened i don't know where you got that but i i remember it um so you know, did something happen? Did I move to a different universe? Um, I don't think, I think the simplest explanation is the, is usually the truth. Let's use some Occam's razor here. And I think sure. it's just human memory is very flawed and very inconsistent and very easily influenced. Now it is interesting though, that the whole thing started with Nelson Mandela and a large segment of the population believing that he somehow died um, in uh, in prison uh, where he wasn't actually ever released. Um, I and remember. yeah, and and I remember him being released. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so do I. Yeah. What's it yeah. live? Yeah. Um, and so and so there are people that you know remember it one way or the other. It's like fifty fifty. Um, you know, it's interesting that. You know, I'm going to get a little crazy. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be conspiratorial now, um, just for, for fun. Uh, it, 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 weird things started happening in the world when they started messing around with CERN. I'm just saying. Oh, yeah. All right, we got, we got COVID. Uh, we got this very weird reality that we live in now that is nothing like what I remember just even 10 or 15 years ago. I think most people agree that the world has changed and people seem more nuts than they've ever seemed in, in ever before. Um, and so, so there is something weird going on and the Mandela effect is kind of happening at the same time. So, you know, if, if reality is not fixed or consistent and if there are multiple universes all around us, which some theoretical physicists say that it is, we live in a multiverse. Um, and there are physicists that say it takes zero energy to create a new universe. So you could just, uh, different decisions can create different uh, variations. So if you turn left or right, there's two universes for each possibility. Um, and that there's a universe where, you know, I became the investment banker that I always thought I was going to be instead of the, the, the bishop. Uh, so there's a universe out there where I'm that. Um, and how would you ever know? Because you could only ever be in the universe that seems real to you at this moment. Um, so maybe there's a little bit of that going on. I don't know. I mean, I don't think there's any way to really know that. Uh, but I think most of it is explained to just the fact that we have really bad memories as human beings. <laughs> but, I'd say so. Yeah, but that's a great question. Thank you so much for calling in. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night. You, you do the same. Take Thanks care. again. It's always a great thing when uh, when people call into the show and, and give us some insight like that. That's fantastic. But uh, I'm going to actually take the phone number off the screen now because we're probably too close to the end of the show to take another caller. But we can probably answer more questions if anybody has any. Did any of you see any? Uh, I do have one. It, I mean, it's not really a question per se it's for it's for advice okay but this comes from a casual sweater on uh, youtube he says uh, an immediate family member of mine has the medieval hell as the main talking point of their faith the consuming fire or my what consuming fire yeah view <laughs> vexes them greatly i have a tough time promoting positivity while not also tearing down their negative hell view mm -hmm. any advice for harmony um, you're going to reach a point with people. Okay. When it, particularly when it comes to worldview and religion, um, just like in politics, same thing where there is just the, no, not enough common ground to work with. 
there just isn't. And a lot of toxic relationships are built on that same principle that there's just not enough relatability there in order to be able to coexist in a way um, that you could deal with uh, with 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 people on on that intimate level like family and whatnot and this is the thing that people try to do this is why people typically have such a negative view of family because they think that because they're blood they have to find a way to get along and I'm, I'm sorry it does not blood doesn't change that fact in fact I think it makes it worse because it there's a lot of truth to the saying that says you can you can pick your friends but you can't pick your family well but you can you can choose who you decide to immerse yourself with and I, I and I really do feel that it is much holier. I know this is against the common trends of people's thought in Christianity, but I think it's a lot holier to avoid family members that are toxic than it is to um, try to get along with people that are toxic yeah, just because they're family and you feel like you should or you have to. Um, no, I've never done that. I, look, I haven't, I'm not saying to model after me, but I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't talked to my mother in, uh, in I, well, I haven't seen my mother since 1992. I haven't seen her since 1992. She lives about um, maybe uh, six hours from me, maybe five. I haven't seen her since 1992. The relationship's too toxic. I've tried. She's tried. It doesn't work. It does not work. And so in order to avoid either occasion of sin, this is the better choice. It's kind of like to the question, the last question we answered from questions from the ether tonight. Um, you have to, you have to weigh the common ground. And sometimes you're too Jesus far Jesus addresses apart. this. Yeah, he does. Jesus yes. addresses this. Go ahead. You know, he, he, he's, he's talking and somebody says, oh, you know, your mother and your brother and your sisters are outside. And he says, who are my mother, my brother and my sisters? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It, yeah. It, uh, now he's not, I mean, we know, you know, we're, we're not playing down the role of his mother, right? <laughs> you know, we, we actually know that, that, that that's not because of some toxic relationship between them two. Yeah. But he's making the point of saying, because really, the, who are your kin? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and your kin are the ones who who seek to do the will of God, yeah. and so and that's who you should invest your time with. That's right. exactly right. And guess what? That's the end of the show, folks. <laughs> it goes so fast. Even when oh, I'm the one talking, it's like it goes so fast. It's like you have a guest on; it goes fast. When you're the only one talking, it's it's it, it goes fast. It's like you know, it's just it's the way that it is. It it it's a very interesting phenomenon. Um, so what's our next show, Brandon? I don't have it in front of me. Demonic you know? possession movies. Oh, it's is that next oh, week? Brilliant. Is it's that two weeks. no no two weeks two weeks uh, that's next right week, the eclipse oh no show next week that's right no yeah. show next week because I'm going to see the eclipse um yeah I'm going to go to see the eclipse so no show next week Mandela affected that's right I will try not to be but uh, <laughs> I went to see the last one and this might be the well this is the last opportunity in my lifetime to see it locally I'll have to go to another country if I want to see it again. Um, and I just don't see myself going to another country just to see the eclipse. I mean, it's a fascinating thing, but I mean, a six hour, a six and a half hour, half hour drive to Illinois is going to be enough. <laughs> so anyway, um, I will not be here next week. We will not have a show next week. It'll be in two weeks uh, from tonight, Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern for demo uh, demonic possession movies and how they got them all wrong. And Brandon did a lot of work and research on that one, so you don't want to miss it, okay? Anyway, thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Father Chris. And thank you, everyone, for being part of tonight's show and for our caller calling in and all your wonderful questions. We love each and every one of you, and we're so happy that you spent tonight with us, that you chose out of all the things you could do on Tuesday night, you spent it with us. We thank, that. thank you for that. Anyway, good night, and I will see you out there in the ether. Good. God bless everyone.